Okay, stream is on. All right. <clears throat> so this is what how I'm going to do today's lecture is uh, the first part. I'm going to explain my solution of block edit, um, and we'll push the block edit assignment deadline to tomorrow evening. So would that be okay? I mean, or do you guys feel you might need more time? Hmm? I'm not going to get that done on time anyway. Sunday? I, I'm leaving out of town. I'm going out of town to go work in the event where I'm not going to really have any time. I, I okay. Don't mind me. <laughs> okay. All righty. I'm not uh, going to win either way. Okay. What about the rest of the class? If you guys get, get a few more days and I show you, you know, what mine looks like, would that be helpful? Yes. Okay. And it's all going to be recorded, okay? You know, so unless you know there's a technical snafu, you know, it's all going to be recorded. Uh, my mic is on, and it is reflected down here as well, so we are all good to go. Okay, so we'll do it this way. Um, I'm not too concerned about catching up with the original you know, schedule, you know, because if if we if I don't slow down at this point to make sure that we all understand the, the concepts and you know, um, so that we will be able to move forward. Um, it's, it, it defeats the whole purpose of this class because you might be walking away with a grade, you might be walking away with some projects that's done, but we are missing the most important part. So, <clears throat> so I'm gonna uh, show you the code, or I'll show you the behavior of the website first, and then we'll go back and look at how it is done. Okay. Because there are a few things about this class that makes this class even more challenging than most programming classes. And I would say even compared to CISP 360, which is you know, one of the classes that goes on to the transfer degree, uh, this class actually has elements that make it even more complicated and more difficult compared to that class. So I'll explain why I say that. Okay. And, oh, this is my home page, by the way. Uh, because uh, you're, you're supposed to have pictures um, of you know f up to five random pictures, right? So I thought you know five, yeah, we can use the Thunderbird you know vehicles. There are five of them, you know Thunderbird one, two, three, four, and five. When I was a kid, you know Thunderbird was a big thing. Okay, so even though the animation was done by puppets, I think um, it was top of the line at that time. You know, so the mouths can move, you know, and they, they can roll their eyes and stuff like that. So that's why mine looks like this. If, if you refresh, you'll see this is a five, and this is one, five again, and this is three, and so on. I don't know whether you guys remember the opening of Thunderbirds. Five, four, three, two, one. Thunderbirds are go. Okay, so, and in exactly that tone as well. So, um, so anyway, so I, I did it just for fun. Um, so here's my admin page, and I want to show you what it looks like. Um, I'm gonna zoom out again, just so that it's easier to see the whole thing. So the way I did it was uh, I put columns. You know, you ha you're supposed to use a table anyway, so yours would have at least the table part. Um, and what I also do, is I put a checkbox next to each item. So when you click on the checkboxes, the checkbox will report back what do you want to delete here you know, when you press the multiple delete button. Um, and then the sorting is done by these you know, buttons here. So you can sort by increasing order with title, decreasing order with title, increasing order with author, decreasing title with author, and, and as well as created. So I'm pretty sure most of you have some you know, aspect of this. You don't have to sort it in both ways or offer you know, all of these options. If you can sort by just created and author, you know, that's good. Okay? If you can sort by only by created and title, that's good too. Okay? You, if you can sort in one single direction, that's good. Okay? You don't have to be able to sort in both directions. Um, but when you look at action, the action column over here, uh, the X obviously means delete. Okay? So if you click it once, uh, it will ask you, it will pop up a box, you know, if you say cancel, nothing happens. The question mark is the edit, okay? I couldn't find a single character that can represent, you know, editing, so I just use, use a question mark. 
Um, when you scroll down, you know, if you're not editing, the bottom of the screen is your uh, insert tool. So if I change the zoom, um, let me resize the whole thing so it, so it shows a little bit be above the headline of the person in front of you, except for the people in the front row. You don't have anyone in front of you. <laughs> but to the people in the back, you know, you have to kind of look over the head of other people. So anyway, so at the bottom of this whole thing, this is the insert item. And you can see the button kind of implies this is insert, there's a plus. Okay. So we'll go ahead and type a few things here. So we'll say, uh, this is the title, by the way. So the title is um, CISW410. And I'm going to use my own name. Oh, this is the other part that's kind of cool. Um, you can click it. And when you click it, it shows you, you know, options they can choose from. But if you can scroll through it. So this is, there's a scroll bar here. So you can scroll through all of this. These are all the names that have been used as authors up to this point. So the database, so the, the script actually goes, you know, find all the uh, username, I mean, the author names that are currently in use, and it will, you know, generate this list. So if you click on one, okay, it will appear into this text box. But if you want to make changes, you can do that too. So if I want to add a C over here, it allows me to do it. So it's kind of a combination between a drop-down box, you know, which is called a selection, and also a text box. Yep. Is this the one that I said the data list? Uh, it depends yep. on the Chrome fill or the autofill. It'll, it'll come up with the names that are not even in the database. Oh. Yeah, I've seen that uh, a couple of times. So okay, so that's why there are two lists, Yeah. right? Right. Because one list is what I generated in, the, in my script, and the other list is actually, you know, um, okay, where is it? Okay, so I, I think I have to go back to this one. So the top one is probably referring to one that the browser is tracking, and then the bottom one, they, there's also a horizontal separator between these two. Right. So the bottom one is, is probably the one that I put onto the list that matches what we have here at this point. Right. Okay, so that's, that's kind of cool. So if I just put the you know, TA, it will match everything, everything that has TA in it. So the lieutenant data is the one that is coming from my script you know, through the database. And then the first one, tag Allium, is the browser putting it there because I have used tag Allium in this field before. Right. Okay. So that's kind of cool. So it kind of exceeds you know, what the homework assignment is asking for. But at the same time, it provides the flexibility of being able to fix something. You know, you, you want to copy it, but you want to make some minor tweaks. This allows you to do that. Okay, I just wasn't sure whether you know we should go with that. But for example, my, you know, it, it came up with my wife's name, and she's not even in the database. Uh huh. Okay. You know, from from Chrome, pro, previous Chrome autofills. I see. Okay. Well, that's kind of interesting. So I'm gonna say tag here. <clears throat> oh, by the way, I went to a uh, fuel target, you know, airgun shooting match uh, on Sunday, the past Sunday. And then the guy who was shooting next to me, you know, we, we, were shoot, we were shooting you know, air guns, not you know, actual firearms. Um, so the, the next guy to, you know, who kept talking to me, you know, distracting me, and he kept asking, so what's your last name? Are you a driver? Are you guys getting it? He knew my first name was Tech. Tech driver, Tech driver that's right. <laughs> and he kept saying, you know, no, my first name is Mini. <laughs> <coughs> you got the wrong driver, I'm meaning. Okay, so today is, is static. This is completely static because you cannot enter the date. Okay, the date has to be the current date, which means it is not up to you to specify what the day is. Okay, and this is one of the problems with, I guess, you know, one, at least one script has a problem of you know, trying to enter the date um, even though there's no such field. So over here, you know, we have the, the free editing area. So you can say um, this is a multiple line input. Okay, so it will it, it can handle that. So when you click the plus button, it will add that entry. So now we have this new entry here. So it, it fulfills that purpose of you know being able to insert items into the database. If you want to change anything, okay, so let's say we want to change this particular test entry, you click the question mark, 
and it will turn that particular row into um, text boxes and also text area. Now, technically speaking, this is not a text box. Um, it is actually one of those, you know, the fancy things that, that we fancy, fancy thing that we were just talking about. So the top portion is uh, generated by the browser, okay, you know, based on how I used this particular page before, and then the bottom part separated by that vertical bar. Because I was always wondering, what is the vertical bar, and how come my name appear is appearing twice? So you did the research and find out, found out that the first part is populated by the browser, and then the second part is populated by my actual script. Right. Yep. So very good. So I can enter Deanna Troy and change, you know, one particular character, you know, to something else. So this is kind of cool. Um, when you click OK, you know, whatever you do here, it's going to update the actual database. And that's it. This is all I have at this point. OK. Uh, this is the second line. Click OK. And that entry should update accordingly right here. All right. So, so are there any questions about the behavior of the script? I can delete also. So we can go ahead and delete an entry. It will ask me first, do you want, do I want to delete this particular block entry? Click OK, and the entry is now deleted. You can also do multi-delete, okay? So we'll go ahead and delete one, two, and three entries. So they are uh, the script one, OK, and test. Okay, and then we click this, click OK, and those entries are now deleted. So it, I think it did all the stuff that the homework assignment required us to do. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is to take a look at the script. But before we take a look at the script, I think it really is helpful to make it clear what happens, what kind of stuff we are dealing with when we are writing a web script. Okay, so that's why I set up my document camera so I can actually scribble on a, a piece of paper. Instead of using the whiteboard, because you know, if I do it on the whiteboard, you guys will have to use a camera to you know, use your phone to capture it. If I do it on the uh, document camera, you can see it, you know, on the the video. Yep, go ahead. Oh, the screen is not. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. And we need some. Table management here. All right. Okay. This is what I do with my other classes too. Is you know I don't use the whiteboard anymore. Um, when I need to do something freehand, um, I just use this tool, which I find it to be quite useful because I can just you know, freely you know. Uh, write whatever I need, including pictures, diagrams, pointers, and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. All right. So there are a few things in play when you're writing a script. Okay. The first one is not surprising. Okay. When you're when you're writing a web script, obviously you know HTML is a part of what you need to know because you need to know, okay, if I want the end product to look like this, what kind of HTML code do I need? So that's partially why you know, I sent an email or announcement earlier this week so that you guys all have access to myadmin.php so that you can at least look at what code is generated. And a lot of times you, know, you can learn from what code is generated to kind of get an idea of the logic behind it. There's HTML. There's also HTTP, which is the uh, Hypertext Transport Protocol. Now, HTTP is important not because we are, you know, trying to regulate the the, uh, the traffic of HTTP or anything like that. It is important because we need to understand how GET and POST work. Okay, because this is how you can send information to a script. They're all done by get and post variables. Is that okay? Now, this particular script, the one that I wrote, is only using get um, requests. It doesn't use post requests. And I did it for a reason. I did it for the reason of, I, I want to make it obvious, okay? 
what is actually sent to the script on the other side. So when you try to add something or when you try to edit something, let me just switch back, switch back to the browser. You can see that you know, in the previous one, which is a multi-delete you know, request, you can see in the URL, multi del you know, open and close bracket equals to 20, open del open and close bracket equals to 22, and open and close <coughs> open del equals to 27, title equals to blah, blah, blah. So there's still a bunch of other stuff you know, that is submitted that if they're not supposed to, but this is the most important one because you know, when you click the button, okay, when you click the button that says you know, uh, delete multiple entries, this item is now defined. So I think it is very important to understand when you click the submit button or when you click a link, <coughs> what is actually being sent back to the script to tell the script what it is supposed to do when it is invoked. Is that okay so far? Okay, so there's that particular element in, a, in HTTP that we have to kind of really understand. Okay, the next one is MySQL or SQL in general. That's your querying language. This is how you talk to the database. Okay, so this part is really important too because you know if you, so before you put a query, an SQL query into your, into your PHP script, you should test it by hand first. Okay, go to the command line interface, open up your MySQL as a client program, and just hand type in the program. Hand type in the script or SQL query and see what happens. Because if you see an error when you hand type it, that error will still be there if you put that script into your PHP script as a query. Okay? Um, if you do it interactively, at least one, it has a chance to tell you what is wrong with your script, and two, it is much quicker to make a change and then test it again. So once you figure out you know, how to do it correctly by hand, what is the right syntax to do it, then you can put it into your PHP script and leave certain fields out to be substituted by variable expansion. Is that okay? So there are all of these components. And I haven't even started on PHP. Microsoft Access doesn't make mistakes, so you can just put it right in, because you know it's gonna be good. It's but then, but then, it's, then it's Access doing it for you. It's making, it does a lot of lifting. It's it does a, does a lot of, program. okay. But I, but I am promoting that we should learn how to do it by ourselves first. Well, I never hand type this. That's okay. I have, I, but that's okay. It's just a, it's well, but you can get by because I'm not going to give you a quiz to help you guys to hand type your SQL queries. Can, but it's, it, it, it even your uh, admin will generate your SQL for you. So, I mean, uh, I mean, when you see those inner joints, Okay, so I. Twice, you know, so I. You can go right in and paste your SQL. Code. Okay. That's what I'm saying. So I'm going to acknowledge that Mason likes to use Access. I like to hand type everything because I like to know how the SQL queries work. By you know, just it's just personal curiosity on my part. Okay, mm -hmm. and Mason likes to get things One done. Thing. So if, if your program's not working, a lot of the times, most of the times, it is in the SQL. You have an error in your SQL. You know that that's a reason. Okay, very good. So, so now, where's PHP? Th this whole picture does not have PHP in it whatsoever, does it? Your PHP is the glue that put all of these things together. Okay? If you take any other, pro other programming classes, like CISP 300, 360, 370, 371, you know, all of those other programming language classes will focus on one single programming language. So they will address the language itself, but they don't have the other parts to deal with. So that's why this class is particularly challenging because you have to deal with the programming part, the logic part, 
but then you also have to deal with all of the other parts. Okay, so this is the relationship between all the various components, you know, just in terms of the buzzwords, so to speak. The next page, we'll talk about, you know, how to um, get started with your, with your scripts, okay? So your script at least should, ha should have two main parts. So there's, a one, there's part one and there's part two. Part one is the parsing and also the logic to deal with all your get and post parameters. So this part is to process get and post um, variables. Because your get and post variables are what is telling the script what to do. Okay, the submit buttons, they're telling your script, okay, we need to do X, Y, and Z. But when you do X, Y, and Z, you need to know some additional information, like, okay, we know we're deleting an entry. Which entry are we deleting? What is the content ID of that role that we're deleting? So there will be additional um, parameters, or get parameters, or post parameters that can tell you that. But this has to be done first, because if you do this first, then that can determine how you generate the HTML, which is the second part. So the second part is the generation of your HTML code. Okay, this is the part where you have to generate the table tag, uh, you have to generate the TD for the header, you have to generate the, um, the T, uh, not TD, TH for the header, and then all the TR you know, for the rows, and then within the TRs you have the individual elements, which are the TDs, and so on and so forth. But you have to get the, you have to process all of the get and post variables first before you get to the second part, because these can affect how you generate that, okay? Is that okay so far? Every time you click a button, it starts from the beginning. So that's the other part of your PHP scripting that can be a little, a little bit difficult to get is there's no such thing as a user interaction loop, okay? There's no actual control structure loop doing that. There's no big loop saying, okay, user do, does something, you process something, the user does something else, you process something. It doesn't work out like that. The user does something, it always comes in through the form, in the form of get and post variables. You process that, you generate the output, and then the user will click on something, and guess what, when the user clicks on something, the whole script starts from the beginning again. That part is kind of important to understand because, you know, as a programmer myself, <coughs> I'm used to batch processing, I'm used to, you know, calculations, real-time systems, embedded systems, and whatnot. <coughs> but I have to adjust my mindset when it comes to your know, scripting because it is it has two distinct you know, portions. Is that okay so far? Okay. So given these you know, kind of big picture you know, stuff, now we can go ahead and take a look at the script and I'm going to explain every single line of code as much as I possibly can. Um, a lot of times if your program breaks, is sometimes it's even escape the string and it, it could uh, cause an error in the SQL if there's like a special character in it. So that's something you can check. But yeah, I always, you can check your SQL in your database to make sure that your statement Okay. So, <coughs> okay, thank you. So this is the way my script is organized. You know, I'm not saying this is the best you know, script or this is the most efficient or the most correct way to get this you know, script done. I'm pretty sure I can move things around a little bit and use more subroutines and stuff like that. <coughs> so the first thing is, um, okay, the prints are not really, you know, that difficult. You know, this is all the stuff that you, you know, generate at the beginning of an HTML document, and then we, there's a matching end at the very end. Um, I have a function here. So when you look at this particular function, what do you think it does? Okay, so let's, let's read through the function line by line so that we understand what it does. This particular get value function has two parameters. The first parameter is name, the second parameter is default value. So what it's, go what it's doing is it will first check whether um, there's a get variable of that name. If so, it will go to line eight. If not, it will go to line 12. Sounds like something that you might need to do kind of fairly often. OK. 
Okay. So if the variable, if the get variable of this partic particular name does exist, then it's going to say, okay, we'll just go ahead and get that value of the get variable. You can make one for post variables also. Okay. Um, if not, it is going to use the default value to initialize the result. Now, result is a local variable. It is not a global, and it is not a parameter. So this local variable result will now become this, the return value of this function. In other words, this function call can be used in a place where a value is expected, like a part of a comparison. Um, you can use it on the right-hand side of an assignment statement. You can use it anywhere a particular value is expected. Are there any questions about this function? Yep, go ahead. So the default value is also telling you whether it, the hit is in set or not? The default value is initialized, or it will return the default value, mm -hmm. but if and only if a variable set. is not set. set. Right. Correct. So it's basically just a default. It's like, okay, if it's missing, this is what it's going to return. Yeah, what I meant was like you could use this value to check whether it's set or not. Correct. So you have to put a value that you're not expecting from the user as a default value, so you can now check it against the default value. Okay, very good. So I'm using this function, I'm defining this function because I'm using it a lot. So for any type of logic that I will be using a lot, I turn it into a subroutine. So this way I don't have to copy paste and modify my code all over the place. The one bad thing about copy paste and modify is as you paste and modify, and then later on you found out, you know what, I made one mistake. Then you have a lot of copies to fix. In this case, if I forget one thing, or if the logic is wrong in one part, I only got one place to fix it. So it is, uh, it's about bug containment. Okay? It's, it's, it, it also makes the code easier to read, but most importantly to me, it is about bug containment. Okay, so now we go for, uh, we look at line 16 all the way to line oh, 26-ish. A bunch of string definitions, okay? So all of these are things that I do not want to use literal constants for. Because in case I, type, I have a typo, you know, I don't want to make a typo mistake at one place that will make it undetectable. So all of these variables, str, blah, 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 will be, through, will be used throughout the script. If I have a typo in the code string, it is very difficult to catch. If I have a typo with the name of the variable, PHP can catch that. Okay? And also using this, if I need to make my script, if I need to change one of the, uh, the get or post variable names, I got one place to change. I don't need to go through the, my entire program and say, you know what, I don't like edit row as a get or post parameter anymore, I want to change it to row to edit. I have one place to fix it, and then the rest of the script will stay consistent. So we talked about this, you know, the advantage of doing this um, in a few classes already, so I'm not gonna spend too much time to talk about it. I just want to point out, you know, this is consistent with what I was talking about. <coughs> the action that um, when you click a button or when you click a link to signify what is going to be done, um, I use you know um, zero and one to encode all the information. So I never really pass anything that I want to put into um, the SQL queries directly. I always rely on my PHP script to interpret the get and post variable values in order to figure out what I should put into the actual SQL script. Because this way, I limit ch the chances of SQL injection you know type of attacks. Yep. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. Absolutely. Is the font size okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. So then it runs like a hit else, like so you check your conditions to see what the submission yeah. is. Yep. So right here, you know, we have um, this is the first time I use the get value uh, function. So what I'm doing here is okay. Let me see <coughs> in which order or um, what what field should I be using for sorting the rows, okay? That's what the order by is gonna do. It is one of the get parameters that specifies what field should I use to order the rows. Is that okay? Does everybody, uh, does everybody understand what it is useful for? 
okay? It's only an integer, okay? Zero by default is specifying content ID. In other words, if there's no get variable saying, oh, order by you know, this particular field, the default is a zero. But zero is specifying by content ID, which is what we want. I think it's created, sorry, I, I, I take it back. It is for, it is by created, not by content ID. But the default makes sense. The second one is increase, decrease. Yeah. It's basically, are we going to specify increasing order, which is ascending? or decreasing order, which is descending. It is also indicated by a single integer. Zero is indicating increasing order. So the default, if you don't specify anything, it is sorted by increasing order. And I think the, uh, the homework assignment calls for, no, 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 this one is increasing order. The other one is in decreasing order. This one is, this one is not. Is that okay? But I also do range checking. <clears throat> Order by value should never be more than three because I only allow people to specify one of three columns for sorting purposes. If, sorting, if order by value is greater than three, I know there's a problem. So if that is the case, if it's out of range, I just say, okay, go back and use the default. So I'm doing range checking just to make sure that I do not encounter anything that is unexpected later on in the script. Um, increase, decrease value should never exceed one. One, zero and one are the only two values that I should use in increase, decrease value. If it is greater than one, it's out of range. Let's go back and use zero. So are we doing okay so far? So, so far we have only processed two uh, get parameters. So on, on line 21 to 23, are you naming variables for your HTML? This one? Yeah, you're defining strings. It looks like you're gonna use those in your HTML code when you Oh, right here. I'm using it already. Those are these are the get and post variable names. Yep. So this way, you know, when there are two places where you need to refer to these strings. One is when you try to interpret the get variable. The other one is when you try to specify your anchors. So when you specify your anchors, you have to specify href equals to blah 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 dot and then question mark. You know, and then we use the variable name instead of spelling it out again. So this way, I don't have to worry about typo mistakes. Okay. Okay. Cool. It's like you make your own access. Well, I'm making my own a structure of a program that is that will help me contain bugs. Okay. So once again, it is about bug containment. One thing I noticed, I get an error if I don't in my insert if I don't contain it in single. Yep, you have to contain all of those except for integers. Integers do not need to be quoted. But you can quote integers too, it, it's fine. Okay, so include password.php is just so that you, know, you guys cannot see my password. <laughs> so that it defines a function called my password, and it returns a single string, which is my actual password. So this way I can show you the script, and you guys won't have any idea of what my actual password is. Some of you probably yeah. want to guess anyway. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. I said hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> no, hopefully it's not the password. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you already eliminated one possibility. Oh yeah, there's so many more. It's okay, I can eliminate a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I define localhost, username, and then password, and then database. Now this is what I also want to kind of emphasize is every time you do something that can potentially have an error that makes your script not able to proceed any further, check for it, okay? Always check and say, uh, was that function called, you know, returning something that's useful? Because if you read the documentation of MySQL I underscore connect, it says it will return false when the connection could not be made for any reason. So you want to check that and if it does fail, then you want to quote unquote die with an error message. But I'm not just saying that, okay, we could not make a connection. I am making use of MySQL I underscore connect underscore error, which is reporting the string that tells you what happened, okay? Is it because the host cannot be resolved? Is it because of the username doesn't match the password? Is it because the port does not exist? At least it will give you some idea of how it failed. Okay? 
not checking and just assume the link is created you know, correctly and moving on is going to create more problems because your, your script will stop working the way it's supposed to at some point. But it is beyond this particular point, so it becomes much more difficult to find out, okay, how come my script is not working? So it's always good to check and catch the problems as soon as possible. So this is a structure co of code that I would like to kind of promote. Okay, if you guys don't want to do it this way, that's fine, okay? Um, because you're, I'm not your boss. I'm not held responsible for your scripts. Yep. You can do a lot with just one line of code, you know, put it in. Yeah. And this is also a very typical, uh, typical kind of code in PHP, in Perl, in Python. Many programming languages have constructs like this, or at least allow constructs like this. Is that okay? I think in the previous class I explained how it works, <clears throat> but I'll do it again. So the way it works is if my SQL I connect returns false, then the OR operator, which is a logical operator, has to, is forced to evaluate the second expression. The second expression, which is die blah blah blah, that never returns. Okay, you call die blah blah blah, your script terminates right away. It doesn't go any further. But as far as the expression is concerned, it is just evaluating the right hand side of the of the disjunction of the OR. Okay. If your MySQL I connect was successful, then the OR is lazy because OR means you know if you have at least one side being true, the whole thing is true. That means if MySQL I connect returns something that is not false, then OR is going to say, hey, I got something that is not false already on my left hand side, so I don't need to go any further. And that's why it's not going to call die if and only if MySQL I connect is returning something other than false. This is a trick called um, short-circuited Boolean evaluation in a programming class. Okay, it is useful in just about any programming language now. Visual Basic has it, Perl has it, C has it, PHP has it, Python has it. Just about any programming language you know has it now. And here's another function. So this function, as the name implies, is clean integer. It's here to clean um, an integer that is in the form of a string. In other words, if there's a particular uh, get or post variable that I'm expecting people to pass an integer back to me, and somebody decides to be naughty and give me something other than an integer, what am I supposed to do with it? Well, first, I need to know it. Second is I need to either reject it and say, this is not an integer. I'm not going to do anything with you. Okay. Or I can cleanse it and go like, well, it is slightly malformed, but I can make it work. Okay. So that's what this function is useful for. The, within the function, the first condition is prac underscore match. It is a regular expression match. And what it is doing is it is saying we can start. This is the beginning. Okay, the caret here stands for the beginning of the entire string. The dollar sign means the end of the entire string. In other words, I am expecting an optional plus or minus right at the beginning of the entire string. I cannot, you cannot have an A to begin this entire thing. You cannot have a space to begin this entire thing. This entire thing has to begin with a plus or minus. The question mark is saying that plus minus is optional. You can have zero or one occurrence of the plus minus. Question? In, in line 50, what is the ampersand? In line, oh, okay. This is uh, passing by reference. <clears throat> it means pass by reference, which also means whatever variable you use to pass to this parameter can be changed in here. And that change will be reflected in from the caller's perspective. It allows the caller to change a variable. Okay, okay I, I take it back. It allows the subroutine to change a variable that belongs to the caller, whoever is calling this subroutine. I, I'll show you, you know, in, in the context here then. When they make use of it. <clears throat> um, okay, so we get getting back to the string matching thing. So this part specifies I can have any number of zero to nine, but I need to have at least one. The plus specifies whatever is before that, I need at least one, but then I can have five, I can have ten, I can have twenty. So together, this entire um, regular expression says I can have an optional sign, which is a plus or a minus, and then after that, I 
I must have at least one base 10 digit, but I can have more than that as well. I cannot have anything other than digits. I cannot have anything, um, the plus and minus cannot be at any place other than at the very beginning of the string. So this is a pretty you know, stringent requirement. Now if you want to control, like you know, I can only have up to five digits, there are ways to specify here as well using curly braces. But this one, I just make it simple. It is just you know, checking the uh, syntax of an integer. If prac match returns true, um, it means the map pattern is matched, so everything is good. If everything is good, I'm calling this particular function called int val. Int val is evaluating the string, and it returns the actual integer value corresponding to the string, and that is now stored in int var. Now, int var is interesting because int var goes back to the question that you were asking earlier. Uh, it has an ampersand in front of it. So when I store something into int var, it is actually storing to the variable that belongs to the caller. Okay, so this is not an ordinary parameter where you can change the parameter all you want, nobody cares. No, this one means you know, whatever variable the caller uses to pass as int var is going to be changed. Okay, um, and then we specify return value to be true so that the caller can instantly know that the syntax of this particular integer string is good. Otherwise, uh, we use a default value and also at the same time we indicate the return value is false. And then we return the return value. In other words, clean int is going to return a true when the string is a valid integer and then the, the value of the integer is stored in int var. If the string is not an integer, it will just use the default value to store it back into int var and it will return the value of false. So this gives me the ability to check and also get the value at the same time. Yes? I mean, Mr. where does int val come from? Okay, so okay, let, let's go to a particular call so that I can explain that. Is that okay? Well, is it in this function somewhere? It nope, it's not in this function. Oh. Int var is, belongs to the caller, whoever is calling this subroutine. Oh, int val? You mean this one? Yeah. That's a PHP function, sorry. I, 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 I misheard uh, what you asked. Yeah, int val is a PHP function that returns the integer value corresponding to a particular string. That's what I'm saying. Sure, absolutely. So if the string had characters in it, would it? Sorry? If the string had ABC. Then it will say it's invalid. It will say, it will say it's invalid because the, the, the regular expressions says you know you can have one optional plus or minus at the very beginning of the whole string, but then the rest of the string can only be a base ten digit, which is zero to nine. So if you put a space in it, even if it's at the end, it will invalidate it. If you put a comma like one thousand one comma zero zero zero, it will invalidate it. This has to be an actual. No, that integer. is because you you already did it hmm? before you entered this function. Well, but if we just put something oh, in by into itself int well is by not itself. good. Okay, in well by itself is not good because if you say two two, okay, the digit two, the digit two, and then exclamation point, and then a whole bunch of, of stuff after that, right. it will say it's twenty two. Okay. So it doesn't really do the validation. It just says I'll try my best to give you <laughs> an integer corresponding to this string, but it doesn't actually report an error either. That's the problem. It doesn't report an error. It would, if you give it something that is not a string, it will just give you zero. So, okay, here. <laughs> All right, so the function clean int is used quite a bit within this, uh, this script here, um, and that's why I turn it into a subroutine, because anything that I use frequently, I turn it into a subroutine just so that you know, I, can, I don't have to copy, paste, and modify my code several times. So are we still doing okay so far? If not, let me know which line, what question, and we'll pause, answer those questions before going forward. It's okay? The prep match thing, uh, so when you start with the, with the carrot in the beginning, that's uh, specifying that it's Okay, you might want to sit down minus. because people in the back cannot oh, see past you. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, I was talking, I, I'll sit down with uh, the, the plus minus thing, the 
carrot. Uh, in, so that says look for one sign that's uh, positive or negative. Well, the, okay, in the square brackets, everything in square brackets specifies options or alternatives for a single character. So in this case, it is specifying this space, this character can be a plus or a minus. Okay? Then the question mark applies to whatever is right before it. And in this case, right before the question mark is the optional, is the character plus or minus. So that means, you know, plus or minus, just one of them is optional. You can have zero or one occurrence of that character. Now this is all documented in uh, the PHP documentation, which I have to admit is not the best documentation. But you know, if you read you know, enough of those, you know, do some experiments, eventually you, know, you will find out you know, how to use it. <laughs> um, I also want to emphasize, you know, just use this opportunity to emphasize that regular expression is a very important topic in any type of scripting that has to do with user input. It's good for validation, it's good for looking for problems, and it's good for you know, manipulating text in general. Okay? So that's why you know, if you're not familiar with uh, regular expression, this class will get you some, okay? but for the most part, you, know, you can learn how to use regular expressions on your own by reading the documentation, reading examples from other people. I will show you what is relevant in this class, but they are much more powerful than you know, what I'm using these things for. Is that okay? All right. So next function is get authors. Um, this is the one that will query the database so I can get all the authors that are currently existing in the database tables. Um, here we have a function called run query. I haven't explained that one yet, but run query is, can, I can explain that later on. So run query requires four pieces of information. And this can be handy, okay? So you might want to copy this one query, you know, into your own scripts because it, I just find it really help, helpful. Link is whatever MySQL I underscore connect returns, okay? We know that what that is. Uh, the second one is really just a query string itself, okay? No big deal, we know what that is. The third one is query, re is query result. It is passed by reference, okay? So when something is passed by reference, query result belongs to the caller. It belongs to this particular function at this point. But if it is passed by reference, it means the called subroutine, which is run query in this case, can change its value, okay? Which is the whole idea, because I need to get it back in case I need to you know, get the rows out of that query. So passing by reference is a mechanism that allows a subroutine in call to change a variable that belongs to the calling code, the caller. Is that part okay or not? If you guys want to, I can use another example, a really simpler example to illustrate it. If you want it, I can do that. If you don't, you know, we can just continue with this. So what is your vote? Well, I think the principle of building the SQL statements uh, with uh, variables and strings, and that's important to do, uh, to have the flexibility in, uh, in what you return. You know, okay. Questions. That's a good thing. But specifically, do we have any questions about for passing by reference? I can, I can illustrate that concept with, a, with simpler examples yeah, just to focus on that one. Okay, let's do that. Before we do it, I'm gonna put a bookmark here. Uh, in VR, you can put a bookmark in a file. So this way, you know, when we come back to this one, we know exactly where we left off. Um, another thing you can also do, uh, I don't know how many of you have an editor that can do this, is to use a to-do. A lot of editors recognize T-O-D-O -O as one single word or uppercase to be special. So it will, it will be highlighted differently, even if it is in comments. So you know, if your editor can do this, um, you can use this feature because it, it stands out. It just kind of like pops up in your eye and it goes like, okay, pay attention to me, to do. And you know, then you can specify what you're supposed to do over there, okay? All right, so just to illustrate passing by reference, um, I'm gonna use byref.php as an example. This is my favorite example in all of my classes. Uh, it's called swap, okay? 
So before we use um, passing by reference, we'll just do it the way without passing by reference, which means it's not going to work. But that's okay because you know that's not the um, main idea. The main idea is to explain why, uh, what it makes it work, and what makes it not work. So swapping is typically pretty easy to do. You have to introduce a temporary variable. So t is x, x is y, and oops, I always keep forgetting the semicolon. Y gets t. So that's a pretty typical sequence of you know swapping. So this way, the, the, the values of x and y should be exchanged. Is that okay? And I'll even do it this way. Okay, I'll even do it like this, and I'll say print um, x equals to x. Uh, y equals to y, and then at the very end we'll do it again. Okay. So in the main portion of your PHP script here, we'll have you know two variables. Okay. Instead of using x y, I'm going to use i j, you know, just to avoid the uh, confusion. So i is just an integer; it has a value of three. Uh, j is an integer; it has a value of sixteen. Okay. And then we'll say Go ahead and call the subroutine swap. Use i as the first parameter. Use j as the second parameter. And I'm going to repeat the prints here. Okay. Except this time, you know, obviously, we don't have x, y. We have i, j instead. Oops. J, j. And we'll put one over here as well. And that's actually the end of the script. But I would make this program a little bit even better. So this way we can differentiate um, the sequence. Okay, this is three, this is one, and this is four. So the yeah, well, we know it's not going to work because uh, you're not returning those values. Well, we'll, 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 we'll run it and, and figure <laughs> out. Okay, so it will sort of work, but not really. Yeah, okay. Working the function when you come out, it doesn't know what happened. So we'll, we'll run this code, and it seems to get it done, but not actually get it done, okay? So you can see the sequence. Um, the way I initialize the variables is i gets 3, j gets 16. That part is not a problem, right? Then we get into the subroutine swap. At the beginning of the subroutine swap, i is used to specify x, therefore x has a value of 3. j was used to specify y, y has a value of 16. Not surprising. Okay. The sequence, the three assignment statements actually work fine because at the end of swap, x get got a value of 16 and y gets a value of 3. They are in fact exchanged. But when we get out of the subroutine, nothing happens to variable i nor j because they were passed by value. Okay, pass it by value. What, 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 what does it mean, pass it by value? So if you want to understand that concept, I'm going to get some prop here. Okay. So let's say this is a parameter, okay? The one way to envision what is a function or a subroutine is it's an office. It's an enclosed office, and there's a person inside to do some work. So the, this particular pouch here is my inbox, okay? So every time you want me to do something that requires some additional information, you have to tell, give me the additional information into this pouch. So when I use when I work on that something, I, I can use the content of the pouch to do, do the work. Okay. Passing by value means next to the pouch is a small copier, Xerox. So you never give me the original item because you don't trust me. You always make a photocopy first. So you run the photocopy and then you put the photocopy into the pouch. In other words, with a normal way of passing parameters, which is what we are doing here, swap is only working with a copy of i and j. But internal to swap, they're known as, the, the one copy is known as x, the other copy is known as y. So inside the office, okay, I'm taking x and y, which are photocopies of the original items, right? So I erase one, write it with the other value of the other one, erase the other one, copy the original value of the first one to the second one. At the end of a function, what do we do with these photocopies? What do you think is going to happen? Recycle bin. Yep. They all go to the recycle bin. 
So that means, you know, even though the subroutine was successful exchanging the values of the parameters, which were photocopies of the original, they were just thrown into the recycle bin. Nobody knew what happened to those things from the external world. Okay? So that's why it didn't work, because the subroutine was working with photocopies of the original. Okay? Now, <coughs> I can change the program just slightly, then it will start to work. All I need to do is to put an ampers end here and put another ampers end here. Now X and Y are passed by reference. Passed by reference, what is that? Well, first of all, we'll run the program again. <clears throat> and it worked because you can see the effect of the exchange was persistent. Okay, the actual variables i and j outside of the function were changed. But how did it work? And why is it called pass by reference? So, so pass by reference is providing uh, the address of the variable. So it's pointer or wherever it's In C and C++, plus, that's how you call it, get yeah. it. But pass it by reference is pass it by reference. So what is happening is, I still have a pouch here, okay? But instead of giving me a photocopy of the original item, you're not giving me the original item. You're putting a little slip of paper that tells me where to find the original item. So from the subroutine's perspective, I'm taking the content of the pouch, it goes like, oh, this is instruction to tell me where to find the original document. So the subroutine now knows, okay, I need to go to, go to the filing cabinet, second drawer, back to the folder, that's what I'm working with. I'm working with the original. Instead of you, you know, taking that the draw, the taking that folder, taking paper out of the folder and making photocopy and sticking into the pouch, the pouch only contains the instruction to find the original item. Is that okay? So pattern by reference is telling the subroutine where to find the original item so that the subroutine can change the original item. Is that okay? At the end of the subroutine, the subroutine now has something that it still has to shred. What is it shredding? It's shredding the instruction to find the original item. It's not shredding the original item. It's just shredding the instruction to find the original item. Is that making sense or not? Is, is that used for like security things to kind of? Uh, no, this is just general programming concept, it, it exists in all known programming language that I know of. Okay, C has it, well, okay, take it back. C sort of has it, <laughs> sorts of have it. C++ has it, Java has it, uh, PHP has it, Python has it, Perl has it, Visual Basic has it. You know all these languages? languages? Sorry? Do you know all these languages? Uh, just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> 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 Go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to say that security is a very small reason. I think the bigger reason is uh, burden on channels because if you have a huge amount of data, mm -hmm. so instead of passing a huge file, just give us the address to the subroutine and then mm. goes over there and updates the data. Um, I would say it's just really generally useful. I mean, it's just a generally yeah, useful, useful programming the concept. Is the, is the user channels. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely not related to security. It's not, it no, exists it's not. not because of security. It exists only because, um, like the swap subroutine. Okay, the swap subroutine. If you don't have pass by reference, how are you going to do it? Right. It, it, it's supposed to change something else, something that does not belong to the subroutine well, itself. You, you could basically convert x and y as a string and pass it by as a result. So. Then you have to reparse the string, get the result back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you could do that, I suppose. Yeah. Yep, that's very roundabout. <laughs> that's the, yep, but that's passing by reference. So are we okay with that concept? You're passing by reference. Okay, all right. So let's go back to the original program that we were going over, and I'm going to go back to the bookmark. Yep. So I, I like that bookmark feature of a uh, VI. It just gives me a lot of flexibility to um, kind of go off, you know, to do something else, and then come back and know where I left off. So that's really cool. Okay, so get authors is going to pass. Um, it's going to call run query. 
This is the other one, the other feature that I really like about VI, but you can probably do the same thing with other editors as well, is I can split the screen. So the top half can be at one place, and then the bottom half, I can look up uh, function run query, so I can look at the actual definition of run query. So this way I can look at how it is used and also how it is defined at the same time, which I find to be quite useful because trust me, I cannot remember the parameters either, even though I wrote the subroutine, okay? So in the subroutine here, you can see that one query has link, I'm passing link. Now they just turn out to be the same name, they do not have to be the same name. Okay, I just have to make sure that this name is used consistently inside the subroutine. It doesn't have to be called link, which is also you know, the name of the variable that I use to pass to that parameter. The second one is the query itself, which is just the name query. And then the third one is query result. Query result, well, okay, I didn't have to use the name query result, but I did. But you can also see that it has an ampersand. In other words, when I change query result because of this expression, that actually changes the query result of the caller that belongs to the caller. Okay. And that's you know, another use of passing by reference. Okay. What about underscore, underscore, line, underscore, underscore? That's a funky name for a variable. And in fact, it's not even a variable. Variable, it doesn't have a dollar sign in front of it. What is it? Well, it's like that underscore, underscore, file, underscore, underscore. Yep, it's, it's kind of like a macro in a way, but if you look it up, uh, line in PHP, it also exists in C and C++ in, in many other languages. It's called a magic constant. And if you look at the description, underscore, underscore, line, underscore, underscore is the current line number of the file. Okay, if I go back to the script, okay, so what am I doing here? I'm passing the line number of this particular line. Let's turn on the line number and of this one. So I'm passing line 73 to parameter line number over here. What, what, what is that? going to do? I mean, this has nothing to do with PHP programming. Well, not normally, but you can also take a look at run query and see what happens when I actually go through run query. By default, I specify the return value is false. In other words, I'm pessimistic. I'm pessimistic and say, nah, things won't work out unless you have evidence to show me that things are actually working out. Is that okay? So the default value is, no, I failed. Okay. So the first thing I do is the typical thing that I recommend you guys to do as well in your script. I use a, an assignment statement as the expression inside the conditional statement. So I'm doing three things in this case. Okay, there are three things happening on line 127. First thing is calling your MySQL I query. Okay, that part we kind of know for sure. The second <coughs> one is to change a query result. That's the second thing. That's the assignment statement doing its job. Okay. The third one is to evaluate it as a Boolean. In other words, I'm asking, well, is query result storing a value of false, or is it storing something that is not false? If it is storing something that is not false, then we'll execute line 130, 130, which really just says, yep, it was successful, very cool. Okay, if not, we're gonna die. <laughs> <coughs> so when we die, we do something other than just dying. We die screaming. <laughs> we die screaming and say, we say, okay, which query, okay, we spell out the entire query. This query failed. But we also say from which line. But that line is not line 30, 134 because that line number, 134, is useless to us. We have to know who called me, okay? Because whoever called me is what I need to know. It's like, okay, where is this coming from? So this line number is coming from the parameter line number, which is having getting the value of underscore, underscore, line, underscore, underscore. So if something bad happens, it will report, in this case, it will report the line number is 73. The script dies, 
but it, it will at least give me a clue oh, of okay. the fact that it died, on um, which line called the subroutine, and why it died. Okay. You know, I view my source code, and when that happens, and it will tell you, like, uh, hmm? uh, out of the, you know, uh, it'll tell you where, what line you have a code in. You can do your source code and stuff. If your program's not working, you get an error and stuff. So, I don't know. It's a, it's a feature, I guess. What, what feature again? So can well, you say that I, again? When I, when I run a, uh, in, in, in a when, I'm, when I'm returning a response and I get an error, I hit view source and then it gives you a message. source? Yeah, and then it'll, it'll read you the message of if you have an error line, you know, so and so. Okay. Maybe it's on default or something, in the browser thing. Hmm. It's good, but I, I like the code. But in, the, the, but in this case, so it will only go back to line 30, 134. It won't go back to the caller of the subroutine. Tells you where your error is and everything, so it's like debugging your program for you. If you have it. Yep. So that's good. Yep. But this tells you who is calling the subroutine itself, which is which is helpful. So you might want to incorporate some of these ideas into your future scripts because it might sound like, oh, do I have so to they, define these they subroutines? All sound great, but the problem is, huh? our code we have such a hard time just getting it to work, <laughs> and by the time it's but working, but part of getting part of hard to get it to work is because you know the diagnostics is not there. Yeah. You're not having the, the right diagnostic tools, so when things are not working, you can. it's difficult to tell why it is not working. It's kind of like a car mechanic you know, with no diagnostic tools, right? The car comes in, it won't start, you don't have a voltmeter, you don't have an ODB2 scanner, you don't have no nothing, right? So the only detector you have is your nose. You can smell, does it smell like coolant? Or does it smell like burnt motor oil? Or does it smell like gasoline? That doesn't help you very much, right? See, it's like, I'm too busy to shop for the to shop for myself. It's like, everything looks like, okay, just the next thing will fix it. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing says, okay, just the next thing will fix it. Yeah, that's called the, the lucky mechanic <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> so I would start to wiggle wires, you know, or back in the good old days, I would start to uh, unhook all those vacuum lines and change the order, right? Hopefully one of those swaps will make it work. Yeah. Except your cylinders will fire in the wrong direction, yeah. wrong order in that case. <laughs> Spark plug cables, just put them in whatever order you feel like, right? Which is usually okay because you know it, when when the when the cylinder fires when there's no uh, gas mixture in it, it doesn't do anything. It's just gonna, you know. <laughs> no up. Hmm. No up. No up. Exactly. It doesn't do a single thing. <clears throat> All right, so getting back to this, are we reasonably satisfied with uh, everything explained up to this point? Okay, so this particular query is special on its own too, because what it does is it is selecting a single field from main content. We know how to do it, that part is no surprise, but we also have group by author, which means each author will only appear once as the result. Because otherwise, if I do not say group by group by author, the same author will appear multiple times. If you say group by author, then it will only, only appear once. So, so I mean, yeah, go ahead. So what is the difference between this query or in saying select this thing? Select this thing? I do not know. That also works. That also works? Yeah. Okay. So if that works, yeah. it's good. Grouping is also useful when you need to uh, calculate, aggregate uh, results, like summation, counting, and that sort of thing. So select distinct here won't do that part. But this works you know, for that particular purpose as well. So if it does return, if run query turns true, it means the query was okay. Then we can go ahead and use this loop to populate return value, which is an array. This is a shorthand. If you look it up, this is a shorthand. So return value is, uh, is null to begin with. It has no particular value. But when you use this particular syntax, it is pushing row 0 as the last item of the array. So it is actually appending to the current array 
so that row bracket zero of this particular iteration becomes the last item of the array. So as you go through these iterations, the array goes, gets longer and longer and longer. Eventually, it has all the authors. So pretty useful construct. Um, I, you know, before this class, before teaching this class, I had like this much exposure to PHP. So I had to do some research and find out, okay, how do I append to the end of an array? And this is the code that I found. I checked out, I checked it out. You know, write a really small program, make sure it works, and then I put it here. Okay. <clears throat> I would uh, write a for statement instead because then you have the i value you could store that as the key. And the i? If, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're storing an array, I, I would generally do a, a for because you have the i and you can use that for the, for the key. But that's implicit already. Because the first item implicitly has an index of zero. So if you don't say anything else, it is always using the numeric version of indexing instead of using strings as an associative array. So either way, um, there's nothing to do with else because you know run query should never return false. If the query fails, it dies in run query. So it never really got here. So lines uh, 82 and 83 and also line 81, they're not really needed. It's just my habit of when I use a, when I type a um, conditional statement, I always type in the, the else case too. And it just returns a, the value. That's get authors. Um, this one is big, okay, so get editable row you know, can be somewhat of a beast to explain, but I'll go ahead and do it. Um, this is, give me a single row to appear in the HTML document as this, okay? So that one function, get gen generate editable row, gives me the editable row, which is this one here. Just the last one, just the one with all the text box, the fancy spanshy you know, drop down box, and also the text area. Okay. It has got many parameters. So the parameters include um, title, author, these are the values. Um, it has created value, which is you know, usually um, initialized to today. Um, it has content value, which is usually which is initialized to empty, content ID value, which is initialized to empty, and also submit value, which is initialized to plus. In other words, the default values is set up for this particular row, but I can pass specific values so that I can generate a row like this. Whoops, like that. So it will pre-populate the text area. Uh, this one I think had, had no author to begin with, and also the um, the uh, the content. Is that okay? All right. So it is probably a good idea to take a look at how this one works. Um, I made link a global variable. I should have turned it into a uh, parameter, but to turn it into a parameter, it means you know, everywhere I call this subroutine will have to change. So I was getting a little bit too lazy at that point, so I didn't turn it into a, a parameter. Um, the other ones, all the STRs, they are basically just global variables of those particular names. So STR title is just the string with title in it. STR author is just author as a string and so on. So all of those are predefined at the very beginning of the entire uh, script. So the generation of, this, of the row, okay, let me scroll back here. It begins with a TR, because that's a row in a table, so obviously it has to start with a TR, and it ends with a end tag of a TR, so it ends here. But that entire row is a form, so this is the form itself, and also you know we have an end form at the very end of the function. So the good stuff is in between, okay? All the good stuff is from line 104 all the way to line 118. Okay, so all the good stuff is in between. So we'll go ahead and start with uh, line 144, 104. 104 is easy, okay? There's nothing to display on the first column because the first column contains a checkbox that allows multi-delete. If you're editing a row, you're not deleting that row. So that's why I left that particular cell empty. Is that okay? 
I could have just you know, put a little dummy text here, cannot delete or be edited or something along that line, but I just kind of left it. Okay, so line 104 is easy to explain. One line of five. Line 105 is the title. So if I switch back to the browser, we are talking about this one. This is line 105. It is generated as an input. The type is text. Now this is the part that makes it useful because I have to give it a particular value. So if this is a row to be inserted, that will by default be an empty string because I don't want to tell people what the title is supposed to be. So people can just you know, enter that. But on the other hand, if it is corresponding to an edit request, this will be populated by the original title so that people can change the title when they're editing a blog item. Is that okay? <clears throat> and it also has a name of string title because you know when I submit this form, the script needs to know, you know which part is which part. So the name is important. Now this is a good time to also mention there are two things. One is called ID, the other one is called name. Okay, both of those are attributes of just about anything you can have in as HTML elements. So what is the difference? It sounds about the same thing, right? ID, name, okay, they're both, they both seem to be used to identify something. Name is used primarily to uh, generate get and post message variables. So whatever name you put here is whatever name will be used as a part of the get or the post request. That's what you see on the URL when it is a get message or get request. ID, on the other hand, is used internally. Okay? So when you're dealing with PHP script and your PHP script needs to go work with a particular element in the HTML document, it will find it by ID, not by name. Is that okay? So that means anything can have an ID. A div can have an ID, a row can have an ID, but names, well, they only apply to something that can pass a value back to the script using post or get. Is that okay so far? Okay, because it makes a big difference, okay? Because these two can be confused. The ID versus names, they have seems pretty confusing. But some of these needs to be a name and others need to be an ID. All right? So this one is a name because we are doing dealing with uh, post. Uh, if you're taking if you have taken 400, uh, CISW 400, which is um, Ajax you know, programming, that's by ID. You identify stuff by ID in that class because you are writing JavaScript. But in this class, we are using server and scripting, and that's why we're going by name and not by ID. All right, so that takes care of line 105. In other words, one line 05 is only responsible for the, the, the second column. Um, the other column, the next column, is a little bit funky because it, in, it consists of several lines to get it done. So from line 108 all the way to line 115, these lines are, are responsible for generating the author's cell. Okay, Let me go back to the browser to show you what it looks like. This is what I mean by that. Okay, It is a text box with a drop down feature. Okay. And this one is a little bit tricky because it involves the use of several elements. It starts with a TD, okay, not surprisingly, but the, um, the item is called a list, okay, but you don't say type equals list, you just say it is using a list called authors, but the field is called author itself. So there are two things, name identifies this particular input field which will be used in the get message as a get variable. So when I use a get variable, it will be named author. But what values can author contain? Well, let's check out a list called authors. So authors is a reference to a list that consists of certain values that you can just click on and go like, oh, I just want this one, I don't want to type the whole thing. Line 109 is really just calling get authors, you know, the function that we talked about a little bit earlier, to get a, an array of authors. So it returns an array that consists of all the authors in the database up to this point. Is that okay? So authors, as a variable, as a PHP variable, 
is now an array. That being the case, the next element that we are generating is called a data list. This is where the list is referring to, and this time it is using the ID to identify it. Because this is the interlinking within the HTML document, and so ID is used, and not by name. Is that part okay? Yes. Okay, cool. So you have to make sure whatever list you use here has the same name or the same identifier as the ID of the data list. So the data list starts here, it ends here, and between, you just have a whole bunch of options. So you just say option, value equals blah, 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 value equals blah, 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 and so on. Is that okay? So that's how I generate that kind of fancy, spanky, uh, drop down box like this one and everything down here these are all collected from authors do we have any questions about this part from line 105 to line 110 with some browsers here. say that one more time in some browsers it doesn't work uh, it doesn't work in some browsers Does it work in Firefox? I so. I'm using Firefox right now. Or Safari. Safari is in that Explorer. Oh, okay. Who cares about Internet Explorer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, okay, so here's the question. Okay, I'm not going to address, I'm not going to give you the solution in this class. What if there's a particular thing that only works in some browsers but not in others, but you decide but you know what, you know, if possible, I really want to use this feature. Uh, if not possible, then I'll use some really kind of clunkier you know, way to do the same thing. What are you going to do as a PHP developer? What are you going to do? Well, you need to find out what is your server, right? Like the not server. Uh, the, the web browser. What is the, the web browser, browser is called a client. Yep. OK, right. so that's, that's a good start. There's Go ahead. Many. I personally use the a drop down box and also a fixed box. So if someone wants to add new author, then the fixed box will be appeared. Otherwise, you can choose from the. Okay, so you're going for the universal solution that works in every single browser. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. That's actually the drop box. But, the but there are times when you need to identify what browser is being used so they can generate the corresponding code that looks that to make things look right in that particular browser. So what do you do when that is what you need? Uh, search huh? Auto search. Auto search. How to? Now, uh, auto search from, from database. Okay. Well, there's a very simple command. I think in Java class, the JavaScript class, they showed it. But JavaScript is client side. But that's yeah. what you need. The, on the client side, that's what it is. So then you pass it on. Your There's a server side solution that only that works without client side cooperation. Okay. So if you just look up PHP client, it should give you an idea. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> PHP client type. How about that? There we go. Get browser. browser. Yep. Get browser tells what the user's browser is capable of, and user agent is the name of the browser. It's actually very handy. You know, this is a really useful feature. It doesn't tell you just what the browser is. It will tell you what operating system the end user is using too. So it will tell you. In this case, it will tell you that if I'm using Firefox or the engine of Firefox, which has a different name. Um, it will tell you I'm using a Linux system. 64-bit operating system and blah, 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 blah. It tells you a lot. So that might be useful, okay? You know, depend, because this is, this, is the, this is PHP only. It doesn't need the cooperation of JavaScript. So even if JavaScript is turned off entirely, this will still work, okay? So, um, so all I'm doing here is really just illustrating, you know, because you, you mentioned that you know, this code may not work well with certain browsers. This is how you can detect what browser is being used on the other side. And then you can generate different code depending on the browser. So if the browser is capable of doing this, use this code. If not, 
use the other type of curve, which may look a little bit more clunky, but it will still work. Is that okay? All right. Cool. Um, the third one is printing the created you know, field, um, which is just whatever is passed to me, I'm just printing it here. In other words, I'm just printing this portion here. This one is not editable, okay? Because remember, you're not supposed to edit the created field, okay? Because the created time is the created time. You know, it doesn't have a separate field for last modified. All right, so that's 116. 117 is the text area. Um, so I use a uh, CSS trick to make it look right. So I use width colon 100% to make it take up the entire width of that particular cell, because otherwise it doesn't look right, okay? Yeah. Yep. It just looks right. So that's just a CSS trick here, uh, cascading style, style sheet you know, trick over there. Um, I just specify a name, um, and then the content of the text area is the tricky part, it's not the value of the element, it is whatever is between the open and the closed tag of the text area. So that's the part you have to be careful, is to put the content value between the open tag and the end tag. So are we still doing okay so far with this? Cool. All right. And then we have one more to go, several more to go. Uh, this one is important. This is a hidden field. So let me kind of just highlight the portion I want you guys to uh, focus on. This is a hidden field. The hidden field is the one that tells when, when the script is invoked again, because I click the link, this hidden field is what tells the script, A, which row is getting updated? Because it contains the, the content ID. The content ID is passed as a parameter, but this is how I can identify which row am I supposed to update when the script is invoked again, because somebody clicked this link. Is that okay? Cool. And then we have a submit button. So this is the final one, which is the submit button. The submit button is this one here. It is OK for editing. It is a plus for inserting. Oh, you were too loud? No, I had to Oh, OK. If they're too loud, let me know, and I can go out and tell them. Is that okay so far? And I think that's pretty much the end of this entire script. Okay, well, okay, fine. We print the end form and uh, also the NTR. So I'm showing you this code, you know, but why, th why do you think I turn it into a subroutine? And not just, you know, this code is only used in two places. But why do I turn this into a subroutine when it's only used in two places? Just imagine this code expanded in the middle of some logic. It just distracts me from the overall code. So turn it into a subroutine makes the code easier to read. Okay. So that's why I turn it into a subroutine. So you might find cases like this too in your script where you know you have some really tedious, long and boring logic that is stuck somewhere. Okay? and it's interfering with your reading of the overall containing code, turn it into a subroutine. Call it, even if it's only once. Only if, if, even if that code is used once in your entire script, sometimes it's still worth the trouble to turn it into a subroutine so that your program is easier to read as a result of that. Okay, all right. So we explained one query already, so we'll pass that one, okay. So this is the process action part, okay? So getting back to the uh, document camera, we are talking about this part now. We're talking about the part where we process the get and post values. Because I explained a lot of subroutines, but subroutines are not doing a single thing until they get called. And so far we haven't called you know, gen you know, editable row, so it is just sitting there doing nothing right now. All right, so process action. So I'm looking for everything that can trigger an action and say, did someone request to do this? Did someone request to do this? Did someone request to do this? Mm -hmm. I check all of those things sequentially, okay, to see what I need to do when I run this script 
this particular round. Question? Nope. Okay, you just need to. Okay, cool. All right. So I will initialize editable edit row ID to be negative one because I don't have a copy ID of negative one. So negative one is just used as an invalid value to tell myself, okay, did someone request to edit a particular row? If so, what is the ID of that row? If it's negative one, that means nobody requested to edit the row. We should do the insert instead at the very end of the table. And then we have um, action, okay? Did someone specify an action? The action is specified, okay, let me go back to the HTML code again. When, see, when, when I hover over the X, you can see, ah, okay. That's the problem with a corded mouse. So when I hover over the X, you can see here action equals to zero and ID equals to seven. That's what the hyperlink is generating, is to specify what action. Zero means to delete, okay? And then the ID is seven in this case. All right? <coughs> if I move on to the question mark, then the action is one, but ID is still seven. One, action being one, means I want to, I intend to edit that particular row. Which row are we talking about? The row with a content ID of seven, okay? So, getting back to the script here. So if an action is requested, then I go in and say, okay, tell me what the action is. And then I compare, okay, is it a delete action? If so, we have an attempt to delete, retrieve the ID as a get variable, clean it up, and then run the query. Is that okay? This else is corresponding to is set. In other words, there's an action specified, but nobody gave me an ID of what to delete in this case, that there's no action. I'm not going to delete anything. Is that okay? All right. Uh, what if action value does not match delete action, which is zero, and instead it matches edit action? Then we go do the editing. Now the editing has very little to do at this point because I want to generate the form for editing when we generate those particular roles. So I'm holding on. Ho I'm holding up the action to generate that particular row, all I do is to store id value, which is the value of the get variable id. I'm just storing that into my own variable called edit row id. So that that way, when I go through the loop to generate the rows, I can say, is this the row to be edited? No. Nope. What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? Ah, this is the one. So instead of generating just the this for display purposes, that row will have all the editable um, elements because it becomes a form. Is that okay so far? You know, just in terms of concept? The de there, there's a ton of details in these things. So at this point, you know, when I'm just explaining, you know, just kind of focus on the overall logic. Unless you have a specific question about a, a technical thing, then let me know and I will explain that. Okay. Next one is to say, uh, did someone ask to do a multi-delete? This particular get variable is set when somebody click the multi-delete button. Okay, so if that button is clicked and also, you know, some check boxes have been checked to select you know, what rows to delete, then we got something to do. If someone click the multi-delete button, but no row is selected, hey, I don't have anything to do. No rows is going to be deleted, okay? So down here, I'm using the get variable to get multi-delete, mode delete, but not mode delete submit. This is generated by the submit button itself. This is generated by uh, the checkboxes, okay? So I get the variable of the checkboxes, which is going to be an array, but I want to double check, okay, just to be sure, because if it is not an array, something is bad, okay, something wonky is going on. If it is an array, if it is an array, the first thing I do is to clean up all the values, okay. I don't want anything funny going on there, okay. So I take every single thing out of that particular array, 
clean it up, and put it in, back into a multi-unit value. Is that okay? Now this is really important because if you don't do this part, then there's a potential for someone to inject uh, like sections of an SQL query, you know, SQL injection, and then your query may end up doing things that you do not expect it to do, like deleting all entries. Okay, even though you're only selecting one, you know, you might be deleting more entries than you asked for. It's totally possible. Yeah, I know, don't hack me. Yep. <laughs> and then we use a really useful feature called implode. Uh, implode is the opposite of explode. Explode will take a string that is comma separated or has some kind of delimiter to separate items and turn it into an array of individual items. Implode is doing the opposite. Give me an array, give me what is supposed to go between each item, and I'll give you a string that has all of these items comma separated. Is that okay? Yeah. Are there any questions about the, the function of implode as opposed to explode? Are we good? Okay, I got some nods and some not nods. <laughs> I'm not. D not. <laughs> Hmm? Sorry? Uh, it's coming from this array. So mult, mult del value is an array already. And this is just specifying what, sh what symbol should I use to separate the values in a string. And then implode will create a long string with each of these values separated from the next one using a comma. That's what implode does. Okay. It's, a, it's a really useful feature. I mean, you can write your own code to do it, you know, but if there's a function to do it already, why not? All right, so we run this query. Okay, so this query is really kind of useful. Um, it's not one of the things that was discussed in, the, um, in, uh, in Carol's you know, notes, okay? but it is nonetheless a really kind of useful feature. So the uh, delete query is about the same as what you would expect of delete from main content. This part is the same as all the other delete queries. But the where is different. Okay, so I say where content ID, usually you use equal sign, you know, which basically says I need content ID to match this exactly in order to only do this to this row, okay, with this exact match. This one is saying, hey, content ID only has to be in this particular list. Okay, so if you have a list that is comma separated, let's say it's one, three, five, okay, comma separated, that in return will specify that we are deleting the entries with content ID of one, three, and five. So it is a useful feature. You don't have to do it this way. You well, can do this with a loop instead. I knew we need to do this, uh -huh. but I just couldn't create the list Oh, <laughs> so I ended up doing one at a time. You can do it one at a time. Yeah. So what is the difference? Okay, so since we're talking about this part, you know, I'd like to kind of dovetail on these you know, comments and, and questions. Well, the, the good thing with one at a time is that you already have the code mm -hmm. from the other side, right? So then you just say, okay, just run that function again. Mm -hmm. So that's the good thing. But now that you know how to do a set, it is more efficient. It is more efficient. It is more efficient. So in general, I cannot say for all cases, but in general, if there's a way to do something in SQL, and there's a way to do the same thing, but in PHP code, do it in SQL, okay? As a general rule, why? You said it last week. So I said it last week, yep. Mm -hmm. So there are several reasons. One, you know, every time you do a query, there's a massive amount, well, not massive, but there's some traffic between the SQL client, which is your PHP program, and the, P and the SQL server, which is MySQL, okay? They may be living on the same machine where the communication is pretty efficient and not really, uh, there's not, not a whole lot of delay. But the second reason is a lot of times, you know, people would use a really massively powerful server for SQL. And by comparison, a WMP server for PHP. Why? Because the SQL server can be used not only to serve up web pages, 
but it can also be used to generate like forms, you know, checks and whatnot. So the, the, the SQL server you know, usually has more processing resources than the web server, which is what is run, running your PHP script. So that's why you know, if you have a way to do it in SQL, do it in SQL, because it has one, it has more resources, two, it is optimized to do this type of thing, okay? And there's also a three, but I forgot what I was about to say. <laughs> Uh, no, le less traffic, less traffic between you know, the uh, PHP server and the, my, uh, the SQL server. So are we doing okay so far with these you know, kind of way of thinking? Okay, because you know, before this class, you, know, you may not be exposed to the concept that the SQL server can be a different machine with more resources, but now you know then we can say, okay, if there's a way to do something on the server side, on the SQL server side, do it on the server side. All right, cool. So that concludes you know, what multi-delete is going to do. And so far, have you seen a single line of code generation, HTML code generation? Nope, we have seen functions that can do that, but nobody's calling those functions, right? So at this point, you know, as far as the output of the script is concerned, it's zilch, other than HTML, head, and the beginning of body. That's it, okay? So nothing is generated at this point. So next, next we process the form itself. And what the heck is that? Because I changed this code a few times and sometimes I forget to take out some code. I'm creating an array. Okay, so I, at least I can explain what each line is doing. Maybe they're not used later on, but I, at least I can explain it. Okay, so we got you know these uh, three initializations of title, author, and content, which were probably done earlier already. Form fields is an array of these three. So in other words, I have a form fields array that has title as the first element, author as the second element, and then content as a string as the third element. And then what, what I do here is I have an array called form value as opposed to form fields that, covers, that has all the get variables of the fields. <laughs> okay, is that a part okay? I mean, is everybody getting this part? Sort of? Okay. So let, let's go through this slowly this time. One, line 27 creates an array called form fields. It is an array of names of the fields that we use in the database. Title, author, and content. From line 198 to line 201, we have a for loop. So in the for loop, we say for each form fields. In other words, the first iteration is going to be title. You know, field is going to be title. In the second iteration, field is going to be author. In the third iteration, field is going to be content. How are we using field? We are using this get value to say, do we have a get variable that tells me what title is? If so, put it into form value in the same you know, associated uh, key, which is field. Uh, if not, just give it an empty string. If I'm not told what it is, just put an empty string there. So that's what this loop is doing. It is just using, interpreting all the get variables to say, okay, did someone turn in the form to specify these things? Then I ask the question, did someone click that edit row submit button, which is this button here? If nobody clicked that, skip this whole section of code. Nothing to do. If so, we got some stuff to do. So if someone, so if somebody clicked this button, then I will say, uh, let's double check, okay? Because somebody can be naughty and specify something other than what I should be expecting, right? So whenever you have a chance to check, check. So I want to check what is being submitted, okay? Is it specifying add or is it specifying change? I'm, on, I'm only going to do something if it is one of these two values. If, if not, I'll just pretend nobody click a button, okay? 
Now, in reality, you might want to keep a log too. You want to submit a log for security purposes. And specify at this time from this IP address, there's a request coming in that specifies an unexpected value for this particular submit button uh, key. Why do you want to do that? In other words, for the else of this particular statement, let me go find the else portion here. For this else here, um, we, okay, let me go back. Okay, I didn't quite do it the right way. Okay, so if it is not one of the expected values for that button, okay, why should I log it? Because somebody might be hacking, exactly. Okay, somebody is playing with the get or post parameters to poke the script to see whether the, the script would do something unexpected by passing you know, all of those you know, other values. So I might want to keep a, tr keep, keep a log of that. So the minimum I want to track would be the time and the IP address and also the actual query, the entire query itself, okay? Because you know, this might be useful later on. Because if this server ends up to be hacked later on, okay, I got some logs you know, of earlier attempts to hack the server that might prove to be useful in an investigation. As opposed to, oh, I'm just not gonna process this, okay? You know, I don't know how to process this, I'm just gonna walk away, pretend nothing happened. So it might be useful to log in and just say that, hey, this is not expected, okay, something is something is, is wacky here. Somebody might be trying to hack the server. Does that make any sense? It makes sense conceptually, but where would you put that log? Where would you put that log? There are several ways to put a log. Um, this was discussed at the first class. Okay. The first class we did a logging thing. So let me, let me remember this, put a bookmark here first. There we go. Um, let's see, main display, no, no, no. Okay, I thought we had a script that would do some logging. Nope, crap. There we go. Test form, logs. I remember distinctly that we talked about how to log, how to put something into a file from a PHP script. So there's a way to do it. Um, there's also another way to do it. Most PHP scripts can connect to what we call a log server. So if you, if you are connected to a log server, which can be on the same machine or somewhere else, then you can just send a log and that server will take care of the logging for you. Conceptually, that's what I thought you would yep. do. Somewhere. Yep. And the log server is really interesting too because the moment you put in a log entry into the log server, depending on who is listening to the log server in, into that particular file, they can be notified. Multiple programs can be notified of a new log entry at the same time. So if you have a um, intrusion detection engine that is active and listening to the log server, then whatever you generate can alert the intrusion detection engine to do further analysis of traffic from that particular IP address. So you know, they, they might be launching some other forms of attack at the same time, so the log server can now coordinate with other type of software to identify what kind of attack are we dealing with here, who is behind it, where's the, where's the uh, location of that particular IP address, and so on. So, you know, so that can be stuff that may prove to be useful, you know, professionally speaking, when you are actually working in a company where they really want to make sure that the servers are safe and detect every attempt of hacking. And I can almost tell you for sure that uh, a lot of web resources here in Los Rios do not have intrusion detection like that. So, so like you would... Uh, Don't ask me why. Put in a code and then, and then return back like an error message to get some information like on the, you know, on the table or whatever you're trying to get into. 
Yep. Something like that. Do you remember, uh, I also talked about, you know, back in 2000, year 2000, year uh, 1999, you know, there were a lot of high school students or other people who got hired as, you know, uh, developers and they are not experienced. They might be copy and pasting code from a textbook. So hackers know those textbooks too. So they would read those textbooks, identify, you know, weaknesses, okay, in the code, and they go like, oh, okay, most people are gonna copy and paste this code. So when you submit this particular value as a submit button, then the script will do that. So that, that guy can return your error code and then he tell you something about the database or the table. Possibly. Or they might have a secret backdoor to sign in, you know, because you're passing a specific value. Or there may be a, speci a specific value as a get variable that quote unquote identifies you as root or as the administrator that will turn the script into a super user mode that will give you ability to do things that otherwise you would not be able to do. So if there's anything like that in a textbook, hackers will attempt those things first. Okay, so it will try to pass quote unquote hidden parameters to poke your script and say, hey, did you copy and paste code from that you know, textbook? If so, I would be able to gain you know, super access to your server. So just be, it, it's just a good idea to check, okay, you know, and report when things do not look right. The worst that can happen when you report these problems is somebody will tell you and say, it's okay, you know, it's not a problem. But at least, you know, as a developer, you fulfill your responsibility to one, check, and two, report. If they don't do a single thing about that report, it is not on you anymore. But if you don't report and you don't check and something bad happens, guess what? They're gonna, gonna come after you as a developer. Okay, all right. Okay, so this part is saying, okay, what if somebody is clicking add entry? Okay, somebody says, okay, I want to add something to the database, add a role. <clears throat> so in this case, I specify where criteria to be an empty string because it will be populated down here. Insert field is going to be uh, is empty as well because it depends on whether this ends up to be an insert or a update query. It is a little bit different. Um, I use a variable to indicate first because this is how I can determine whether to use a comma to separate items or not. Okay? Well, it will be clear what I mean by that. And then now we have this loop making use of form fields, okay? So once again, I'm using the array called form fields, which is title, author, and created, okay? Content, sorry, not, not created, but content. And inside the loop, the first thing it checks is, uh, is this the first entry? If not, if, it, if this is not the first entry, then I'm going to specify the word and, and also specify a com, uh, a I specify and for a where query, and I specify a comma for the insert query. Because if it is the first, then you don't need something to separate from the previous item. If you're the first item, there's no such thing as a previous item. On the other hand, if you're not the first, then you have another item ahead of you, before you, and you need a separator to separate yourself from the item before you. And that's why I use the first as a variable, and I use an and as a separator for a where criteria, and I use a comma to separate the insert fields. Okay. So after this, inside this loop, you know, after you know, creating the separator, the next thing we do is we are just concatenating um, the field value itself. So this is really just concatenating. This is the concatenation symbol. Is concatenating the name of the field, which is dollar field, equals to, and this is a single quote because the value that you want to specify should always be quoted. So that's why there's a single quote here. And then inside here is the use of MySQL I real escape string, which guarantees, okay, I keep lifting the mouse button at the wrong time. So this particular function makes sure that. Um, SQL injection would not work. Because if the string itself contains a quote, guess what? It becomes a backslash quote. Okay, so that's no way that you, your query can have injection inside <coughs> of it. So this is for security purposes. Yep? When you use that to try and test the, the SQL injection code, mm -hmm. it still is causing problems but where are 
are you using it? Are you using it when you're rendering, or are you using it when you are about to store it in the database? Uh, so it needs to go into a database. Yeah. Okay. So so the test is this. Um, let me let me click OK first. Okay, and then when we insert, um, <coughs> are you having problem when you have like uh, a quote in here? In um, one of the fields. The brackets? The script? Okay, you mean this one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we'll so we'll do a script like this. And in here we'll try something that can be also be funky like O'Neill with apostrophe, right? And then over here we'll do the usual stuff, nothing too major here. Click plus. And it doesn't do us there's, there's no problem because um, to make this not run as JavaScript is when you render, when you print this out as a part of the table, you need to use not the MySQL I view escape string, but um, HTML entity. HTML. Yeah, I, I, HTML so when entity. I render it, I, I thought I had done that too. Yeah, when you store, you use the MySQL I real escape string. When you render, you use HTML entities. Probably put them in the wrong place. Okay. Well, we're we're glad that we talked about this, right? You know, so because you know this way we can we have time to fix all of those by Sunday. Okay. So where was I? Oh, right here. Okay. So one will you know uh, handle the where's criteria. The other one would handle the insert criteria or the insert fields. So when this is all done, when this loop is done, okay, I like vi because when you highlight a closed curly brace, it highlights the beginning of that thing. So when this loop is done, then we'll go ahead and run the select query first. In other words, we are checking for duplicates. This code here is checking for duplicates. Because when you read the query, what is it saying? Select count content ID. So I'm not returning the rows. I'm just saying, are there how many rows match this particular criteria? Criteria. Okay? It can be zero, it can be one, it can be whatever. Okay? So I'm just you know, counting the number of rows where and then substitute with where where criteria. That's what the loop is constructing. So the loop is constructing title equals quote blah 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 and author equals quote blah 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 and content equals quote blah blah blah. That's what the loop was creating all this time is to create you know, that conjunction, that and uh, expression. So that and expression is going to go where the uh, where criteria variable is expanding. Okay. So I'm you I'm calling run query again, which you know, kind of consolidates all the error checking with you know the die message and stuff like that. If it is okay, if it returns true, that means you know, the query was successful. If it is successful, I use fetch row to get the one single row of response. It is guaranteed to have guaranteed to only have one single row to tell me how many rows fit that requirement. It can be zero, one can be any number, but it will just give me a number. So I get it row. I know the, the row only has one single field, so I know this is the only element with that row that actually has something. If it's greater than zero, then I would just say, hey, this is duplicate. Okay, not gonna do anything else. Is that okay? So it's just checking for duplicates. If it is not greater than zero, that has to be just a zero, then we know that there's no duplicate. When there are no duplicates, then we'll then we have to differentiate between the two possi possibilities. One is this is a an edit request, and the other one is this is um, no this is an add request. Sorry, so this one checks for an add request, which is uh, corresponding to an insert statement in SQL, or the alternative is this is a change or altering type of request where we will use an update query instead of an insert request. So the format is slightly different, but they will basically do the, do the right thing. Um, one thing that is important is, um, okay, there was one thing. Oh, okay, 
So when you use update, um, you have to be careful to only set the, the field values where they should be changed. Content ID should not be changed. Created should not be changed. So only the other three fields should be changed. On the other hand, when you're inserting, when you're inserting, then you have to add this one. <clears throat> because insert fields will take care of title, author, and content. But when you're inserting, you also have to specify created. And you have to use current underscore date as a SQL function to return the string corresponding to the actual current date. But you do not specify content ID because content ID is also incremented, so you don't specify that one because otherwise your query will come back with a warning at least. Is that okay so far? Okay. How do I know about using these particular ways of using these SQL statements? You look them up, so like oh you man, you. You, you saw through my truth yeah, just the first moment. I was hoping that someone would say, but tech is only because you know everything. I do know everything because I know how to do this. See, the, the thing is, now comes the experience because there is so much garbage on the internet when you look it up. Yes. Uh, and so just to sift through it and find the right answer, mm -hmm. it is very frustrating when you're a beginner. Oh yeah, I understand that part. Yep, go ahead. If, I'm, if it would be appropriate for me to add to this uh, little discussion you two are having, um, I don't see, other than the read manuals, I really don't go anywhere other than IRC or Stack Overflow because Stack Overflow enforces the uh, answering of, right, Mm -hmm. Usually, YouTube or, or not even Google, they're owned by the same person. Um, uh, it usually, it returns the results of the top voted um, answers and questions on uh, Stack Overflow. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so this is where I go. Okay, so when I look up something, if it's an SQL question, I would locate the link that brings me to the dev.mysql.com website. This is a lot of stuff to read. Well, that's the thing. This is very confusing. So then, this right here, <laughs> I end up going to start uh, Stack Overflow. And Stack Overflow has so much unrelated information or like the same information. Now, so I go to Stack Overflow too. Yeah. But when I go to Stack Overflow, I always know that you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Right. Yeah, you have to read the entire thing and figure out, is this person trying to yeah, and the frustrating part is to say, oh, if you have Ajax, just learn Ajax to do this. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's sometimes it is. Yeah, but learning how to read uh, documentation like this is really kind of important. It depends on your objective, you know, of you know, taking this class. If your objective is really to get into PHP scripting and become a web developer, learning how to read this documentation is crucial. Okay, because it's not just SQL, it's also PHP, and guess what? By the time you walk out of this door, okay, if I'm talking about a new feature in something, by the time you walk out of this door, it's already obsolete. So you know, what you really need to know is how to learn new things on your own. Now, I'm not saying that you know, from here on, you know, this half semester, I'm just, I, we'll, we'll just cancel all classes because you guys are all gonna be learning by yourself. So I've gotta show you guys how, where to go to kind of read now, I know this stuff is tough. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here that I may not even know how to, how to do, okay? Because this is the syntax description. Just the syntax description itself is, can be overwhelming, okay? If this is the first time you read syntax description, that can be overwhelming because this, this is not learning a new language. This is learning the language to describe a new language. Microsoft is 
this is from MySQL, but SQL is SQL, which means, you know, MySQL, S My, uh, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, PostgreSQL, they share a huge subset of SQL, and most of the time, you know, if it works in MySQL, it will work in the other SQL engines as well. Okay, so when you read this, how do you read it? How do you read this syntax description? What are those, you know, square brackets and the dot dot dots and the, let's see here, square, uh, uh, round parentheses and stuff like that. How do you read all that stuff? If it is in blue, it is verbatim, okay? So insert is just insert, okay? Delayed is just delayed. If it is italic, like table name, it is just a placeholder. It is just telling you that this is a place where you have to actually specify the table, the name of the table that you want to insert into. Okay? So right there, I'm telling you, okay, insert everything in blue, italic, excuse me, blue, capitalized, and not italic, is verbatim. If it says update, it is just U-P-D-A-T-E. If it is in italic, lowercase, it is a placeholder. It is to be substituted by something else. If it is in square brackets, like this pair of square brackets, it is optional, which means it may be there, it may not be there, either way is okay, okay? If things are separated by a vertical bar, it means they are alternatives. So, uh, Choose one, so okay? From this documentation, uh -huh. you think uh -huh. Into is an optional word? Yes, so into is optional. Really? Yeah. I always thought it was a it is, Oh, it's absolutely optional. Okay. Now, this is where, you know, when you use a generator or when you use a syntax highlighting editor, you might get into trouble because the syntax highlighting editor may be pre-programmed to a syntax that is not exactly the right syntax. So something that is optional may not be recognized as optional by your syntax highlighting editor. Therefore, it will highlight something as wrong when it is actually okay. Okay, so into is optional. Um, ignore, what is that? Ignore is optional. Table name is obviously not optional. Okay, round parentheses are just round parentheses. Okay, parentheses are just what it is. Okay, parentheses. Uh, when you see something like this, it means um, column name can be. It means this is this part is optional, and then the dot 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 means any number of occurrences. So that means, you know, inside here you need to have at least one column name. Okay, that's mandatory, at least one. But then you can also use a comma and separate another column name, and then another comma, and then another column name, and so on. Okay. Um, let's see what else is here. Uh, oh, this is a good one. What is value list? It's not specified here. So value list, as it turns out, is expanded here. So value list is value, it, it, it needs to have at least one value, and then but you can also specify a comma with another value, and then once again we have the dot 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 to mean you can have any number of comma and then value. Value itself is italic, which means it is to be expanded into an expression or a default. What is default? Default is in capital letters and it's in blue. What does that mean? Keyword. 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 Default is just D D F A U L T. Okay? It doesn't expand to anything else. But the expression is just an expression. Okay? Two times some other field is an expression. Current date is an expression. Is that okay? Curly braces is really just a way to contain something. So it means choose, it has to be one of these two. It is not optional. It has to be one of these two. Is that okay? Assignment is a column name which is going to be substituted by an actual column name. Equal to, this is just verbatim, it is just equal to. And the value is going to be a value, which, is can, which can be an expression, or once again, default. So this is how you read the description of the syntax. Learning how to do this is really, really helpful. 
when you want to become a developer or when you're actually developing code. Because what if your boss, you know, six months from now, your boss, you know, tells you, the same boss who sent you to take a PHP class <laughs> says, you know what, I heard a lot of bad things about PHP. I want you to write in Python. What are you going to do? Take a class in Python or learn how to write Python yourself by learning the syntax of Python using this kind of description. Now, taking a class is useful. I'm not saying you know, don't take a class, it's not going to be helpful. It is useful. But the class can only teach you so much. Okay? It can get you started. But there are always things that I cannot teach you because I don't know it yet. Right? So what I don't know yet, how do I learn? Who, I, I'm not going to take a class from somebody else. I have not taken a class for a long time. So how do I learn PHP when I have no experience with PHP before? This is what I do. I just learn the syntax and, yep. It, it kind of seems to me like what you're saying is that um, the more you, as in you specifically, but also anybody who does the same thing, like once you, as long as you keep practicing and learning new things, learning new things like how you learn PHP kind of on the fly would not be as difficult. It's not so much on the fly as it is um, on demand, I guess you can say it's on uh, demand. Just, just a difference in the way you and I talk. It's basically right. what I meant. Yep, so syntax of uh, PHP in the yeah, manual. I mean, in the, I mean, like, this class is moving so fast to me that I feel like I've learned like <laughs> four languages in this past four months because I had to. It was on demand. Mm -hmm. um, Well, you are learning these two for sure. <laughs> but but what I really want to emphasize is really you know be so okay. There are two points. First point is, um, if I have a choice, I'm not going to click on the Stack Overflow link. Okay, I will look for the link going to PHP.net. I will look for the link going to W3 uh, School. I will look for the link that goes to the SQL, you know, website. Okay, and the second thing is when you look at language reference, then you want to kind of look into. Um, okay, I'm just going to look for one. Types, variables, constants, expressions, control structures. Okay, that's a good one. So you look at the control structure here. What it's saying is. If is the conditional statement. Now this is really poorly written. Okay, if you ask me, the syntax description on PHP.net is one of the worst because it doesn't highlight which part is the keyword, what is mandatory, what is optional. It only tells you some kind of really general description, um, which is not good. Okay, I can give you an example of a good one. Uh, C syntax. Okay, syntax of C. Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not a bad option for the most part. Um, sometimes it gives you a lot more than what you need. Okay, no, maybe not this one. Okay, this is a little bit too much. But uh, so, so the bottom line that I, want, I, I really want to convey is um, this is not a very good description, you know, but it is it's a good starting point, okay? So what do you do next? You're trying to do something, you look it up, there's a suggestion of, okay, looks like this is going to work. What are you going to do next? Try it. Try it out. Try out, exactly. What if you think you might mess up your database in the process, so you go, you're, you're hesitating to go like, uh, I don't know about this, okay? Because if I if I did it wrong, I might end up, you know, posing my database. What what are you gonna do? Well, it's not a big deal, especially in our case. We have such a small table to just do it here. So. Well, it can be a big deal because uh, you might have a lot of test cases already set up in your database, and you don't want to lose those, right? So it's just back it up, rename it, whatever. Okay, very good. Okay, I like that word. Back it up. How do you back up a database? This is something that we haven't really talked about in this class, but I think at this point, 
we might want to learn that. Okay, how do you back up a database? You're not a database administrator, and the database administrator says it's up to you. You back up your own tables. I'm not going to touch your own table. Yep, go ahead. MySQL dump. Okay, very good. I like that. So MySQL dump is a command. Okay, if you just you know, enter that, it will just tell you what to you know, what you can do with it. You can specify options. You can specify which database you're backing up. Okay. So let's give it a let's give it enough information. I wanted to back up the database under my own name, okay? And you can enter yours, okay? And it will fail for for sure. Why not? why do you think it, I know this is going to fail? I didn't specify my password, right? I did not specify dash p. Your database is protected by a password, okay? Even though it's not really that much of a secret, it is a password nonetheless. So this one tells me access denied for user blah 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 because I didn't specify a password. Okay, fine, specify a password, and it is. <laughs> All right. So it cranked out a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, what is it? What what did it crank out? Okay, you can look into this and you will figure out. Oh, I can recognize some of these. Insert into main content. Values, one, number one's log, number one, some kind of date, some kind of block entry, comma, three, da 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 da. What are those? Those are rows that we have in that particular table. Okay. What else is did it generate? It also generated stuff like this. Drop table if exists. Main content. In other words, this script, whatever it's generating in text, you capture it in a file. And then what you can do is you can redirect it into the MySQL client to restore your entire database. Is that okay? Allow me to illustrate. Okay, so this is something that you might want to you know, remember how to do, you know, since this is being recorded, it is going to be recorded, but you might want to remember it's today's lecture that we talk about this. Use the greater than symbol to mean redirection. So instead of printing everything on the screen, which is not really useful, now you're redirecting the output to a single file. So now we can just, you know, name the file my, te uh, my, my name with uh, MySQL as an extension because it's all going to be commands in MySQL. Uh, enter my password, and it seems like nothing happened. Well, it happened, but all the outputs that we saw earlier on the screen in, on the console is now captured in that file called tauyeung.mysql. If you're not convinced, we can just take a look. Okay, it has got a lot of comments. And then, because I use a syntax highlighting um, editor, it says, okay, we, the first command is drop table. In other words, it's recreating every single table. If I had a table like that, it's going to drop it first, and then it recreates a table to be exactly the same as what this file is specified. Okay? So every command that you ever need to know to create, and then we lock table, we insert into table, you know, this is. The likes thing is really just an example that I use to illustrate the join operation. Okay, so that's you know one thing. And the main content has its own drop table and then create table. The one thing I don't really know exactly is why it uses backtick, but you know, apparently you know backticks can be used. And then we have one gigantic insert to insert to recreate the content of main content. And when this is all done. It's, uh, it has people. Uh, that's from my test database explaining the join operation. Okay, same thing over here, and that's the end of it. Okay, so now I'm gonna go do something dangerous. Okay, so if you follow me, then do the same thing, and you do not create a backup file first, you may not be able to recreate the whole thing. But I'm fairly confident in my ability to recreate everything. Okay, so we do this. Uh, okay, so connect to the database. Uh, show tables. 
drop likes. Uh, you have an error. Check the manual. Okay, how do I use drop? See, I have these questions all day long. I cannot remember the syntax of anything. So I just say by SQL drop. Hmm? Well, let's read the syntax. It says drop database or drop schema if exists in a DB name. So this is dropping the entire database, which is not what I want to do because if I drop the database, I have to create a database again. So I want to drop table instead. So drop table syntax, let's read it. Drop table, and then the other parts are uh, optional, but I have to specify table, which I forgot. Okay, so we say drop table likes, drop table main content. Okay, okay, so I have just done something that is really kind of dangerous. Why? Because if I go back to my script and refresh, what do you think is going to happen? No. no, 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 I will get something back because I was, I have been a good kid. Santa says, <laughs> I'm getting something. Select from, select star every field from main content order by da 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 da, failed because table doesn't exist because I just dropped it. Isn't this cool? I think it's really cool. And where did it fail? Line 299. So let's go find where is line 299. Aha. So it is this particular query that has failed over here. In other words, it's not reporting the line number of the subroutine. It is the line number of the caller, which is far more useful to me to diagnose the problem. OK, I did something bad. I messed up my database. What do I do now? I have to restore the database, right? So I look for that you know, backup file, okay, which is called you know, tauyeung.mysql, okay? And this is how I restore it. It is, it's, it's simpler than most people think. This will do it. Instead of using a greater than symbol, I use a less than symbol. So a less than symbol means Whatever is in this file, pretend that I type it on the keyboard. In, in, in short, that's what it's doing, okay? It is redirecting the file to become the input to this particular program. Okay, so let's do it. Um, okay. Oh, okay, forgot to specify database. So we have to specify that. There we go. Seems like nothing happened, right? Go back to my script, refresh, and I got everything back. I think this is absolutely essential that we learn how to do. Now that we have a database you know, with some entries and we don't want to recreate everything from scratch, this is useful. It also allows you to create alternative databases for testing different things. So you can restore it to one particular version to test one specific thing, restore it to another specific version to test something else. So this gives you all kinds of possibilities of you know, testing, backing up, you know, making sure that you, know, you don't lose anything in the process of doing this. You might have a few naughty classmates, right? Go into your site and start deleting all your entries. <laughs> it's okay. Restore, got everything back. Thank you very much. Is that making any sense? Yeah, still you didn't create any of the assignments. Huh? Of them, what have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but I think this is important. If you don't get the command, you know, the first time, you cannot remember exactly what I typed. It's being being taped. Okay, you can just go back to that time and just kind of look at it again. It's the concept that is important. Okay, you're making sure that your stuff is backed up. Now, your files are easy to back up, right? Because everybody has access, you know how to use WinSCP, you know how to use you know, other types of software to back up all your files. So that's not the issue. But how do you back up your database? 
your database is not stored in a single file. This is the way to convert all the entries in all your tables into a single text file. So when you download that text file onto your PC, you have just made a copy on your own PC of the entire database. So even if I remove everything on the server, okay, you have a backup. The moment I recreate your account, you can just repopulate all the files and the entire database back on the server. Okay? Now this is, I think this is really important, okay? <clears throat> and of course by talking about this, I have lost track of what I was talking about before. <laughs> Very typical of me. But Check your command history, that's how I always remember what I was doing. Hmm? Check your command history, that's how I always remember what I was doing. My command history? Like, like oh, your like, command history. No, you can check your command history to remember what you were last doing in the terminal. Oh, okay. But I don't have that in a mental well, way. Well, yeah, you just pressed up. <laughs> <laughs> but I cannot remember what I was thinking about. <laughs> I, have a, I have a train wreck in terms of, you know, uh, the mental thing. Okay, so this part is just checking for duplicate. If, it, if there's no duplicate, it will go ahead and either uh, insert or update. Okay, this is where we left off. And if the query is successful, then it will empty everything. In other words, it makes sure that after I do the insert, the new form will start empty again. That's all it says. Okay. Is that okay? So let's go ahead and do something duplicate and see what happens. So we got A, B, C, add, and then we have A, B, C, add. It says it's not added, and but I don't see the error message anywhere. Dang, okay. Okay, it's supposed to be there somewhere, but I, I think I might have taken out the code to actually print uh, the message that it is duplicate, so that's why it's not generated. But the key is, it doesn't appear here either. Actually, this is not a question as I was writing my own code. Uh -huh. That my messages were appearing all over the screen, some on the top, some on the bottom, here, there, there. But ideally, all the messages should appear in on one line, like Correct. at the bottom of the screen. Yes. And I, I know last week you had a shown trick. the trick of uh, saving uh, in a string first. In a string first. So this is yep. what you do with the message also, and yep. render it then? Yep. So at this point, I have not rendered a single thing. I processed the request to do things. I do all of those, but I haven't generated a single line of output yet. Well, I shouldn't say that, but because, but in terms of the main content of the body, I have not done anything. I created the HTML tag, the head, and the beginning of the body, and that's all I did. Okay. How did you uh, refresh the page if you delete something? Do you use, use the header? If I delete, how do I? How, how do you refresh the page? Uh, Re-render the, the table, basically. Re-render the table. Well, the way our thing is working, we're showing the table and then we're doing things, right? Right. And let's say you delete one row, uh -huh. and, and then you want to show it in your table. Similarly, if you add one row, you want yeah. to show it in your table. But because I process the request before I generate the table, when I generate the table, it will reflect that the change has already occurred. But we didn't do that when I signed with that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's good, because we learned something new today then. So the way we did it, so I think most of us, we, we, we displayed our existing table, right? And then we had an input field for edit, and another input field for add. Mm -hmm. And we added something into the table, and then we wanted to see our table shown in the same sequence again. Mm -hmm. Or we deleted something, and we wanted to. Okay. That's the thing that we had already rendered, right? Because we did the first part of our program showed the table. Like but why do you want it to show the table first? Oh, because we thought this side would be done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that is why you know you, you kind of need to follow the general structure like this. You you do all the processing first, okay? You 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 ask, okay, am I asked to do something? Well, what what am I asked to do? That the 
a user is sitting on his terminal and and they need to know what's in the database mm -hmm. and then they're going to update something to the database or add something to the database, right? So first of all, we need to show them all the data. Okay. And then give them the option, okay, do I want to update something from this? Mm -hmm. Do I want to add something to it? Right. So we had a multiple delete, a single delete, a yeah. single edit, yeah. and a single add. Mm -hmm. So when we did all those functions, then we wanted to reflect that into our table that we had already shown right away. And if we do it again, then actually we're showing two tables. So the idea is not to print the table first, but to do all the processing that you are asked to do first. So it really goes back to this picture, because this picture you know, will work, doesn't matter whether you want to do it the fancy way, like you, know, you have editable rows, you know, like the way I do, or whether you have separate forms to present the user. But either way, you basically, you want to process all the get and all the post requests first. In other words, at the highest level, the first part of your script is trying to determine what am I asked to do, okay? Now, if you have a web page that really doesn't have any buttons or it doesn't really have any get variables or post variables, obviously, there's nothing to process. But on the other hand, if there's any type of get or post variables that you're expecting, process those first, okay? Especially the ones that reflect that the user has clicked on a button or has requested something to be done. So process those first. So you figure out in this invocation of this script, what am I supposed to do? You figure that out first, okay? So after you process all of those things and you know exactly what you're supposed to do, then you move on to the uh, HTML code generation portion. Now if you have warning messages and other things that you are generating um, from the first phase of your script, you store those into a string. You don't display those just yet. You store those things in a string, so by the time you get to the second part, then at the right part of the table or at the right part of the div or whatever you, you, you put all your error or warning messages, then you print those out. So that's the general idea of you know, writing a web script. It doesn't matter what language you're dealing with either. You can be using Perl, you can, using, you can be using PHP or Python. The general idea of dealing with the request first, you know, or the, the get and post variables first, then go ahead and generate the code, that's you know, basically the, the overall scheme of how to write web scripts. Is that helping? That's okay. You can restructure your code. I mean, you know, you can always restructure your code to do it this way. I you use know. the header, header You use the what? Header. Header? You mean the sorting ones? Oh, I see, yeah. So, yeah. so there the are different tricks. One is you uh, basically, it takes you to the top of your program, which basically re renders the page. Yeah, so, so she's saying you, know, you, you create an anchor. Yeah, you create an, uh, the anchor right at the top of your program. Yeah. And when you're done, you just go there, so then you go down, and that re renders the screen. So that's what she's Usually when you submit a query, yeah. you want to refresh the page so that someone doesn't click the again and again and doesn't refresh the page and the same query will be processed again. So when it refreshes, it gives you the main page without any, like, uh, without any uh, get or Okay, so you cleaned up all your, your, your variables. Yeah, but, but when you insert at all or update, uh -huh. When you refresh it, yeah, when you add the code, header into uh, header location, uh, like admin.php without any post or uh, get variables, then it will refresh your page. Okay. And uh, if someone submits a button again or just. Okay, I see what you mean. So you're basically refreshing the page again, but with no 
get or post yeah. variables, you make it clean again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's good way or not good way. Because I delete something not to refresh, it's still there. So I mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, you can see from here. Refresh. Yep, that's the way it is done here. You can see you know, after an insert, you know, all of the get variables are still here. Which means if I refresh it, it will try to do this again. again yeah. Yep. But it will only delete it once because there's only one row of that particular ID. So if I delete one of these, okay, let's pick one to delete. Let's say this one. It says okay. Yep, so you, we still have it here, but I can refresh this as many times as I want. It, it's not going to do this. It's not going to do anything because there's only one row of ID 10. It's gone now. So I cannot delete it again. Mm -hmm. It will be okay, but before that, if you insert a row and refresh it again, then it will insert another row. Right, right. Row. Yep. So that's why I think that's why you know uh, Carol wants to check for duplicates. You know, partially it's that's the reason. Also for the duplicates, is it like uh, should we uh, always look for the three columns? Sing it. Should we al always look for three columns like? Well, it's up to you. I mean, that part is entirely up to you. Well, you can, if you can check for one, you can check for all. So the, the mechanism is really the same. It's just, you know, how long is your where clause, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you, if you can check for one, you know, that's, that's fine. Okay, so the assignment is, should we check for all or just for one? Well, the assignment... You check for the title, right? If I'm not mistaken. I cannot yeah, remember. <laughs> Usually with one title, if we have something already, then we should look for that. Only for the title. Uh, the rest of it can be anything. But two authors can have the same title. So two authors yeah. can have blocks of the same title. Right. Today's a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. But the um, but since we are in this particular discussion, um, emptying out this portion is good it keeps it clean and it avoids confusion but at the same time you know i think the assumption that this portion is always right you know is is something that we have to remember it's like this can be anything because you know now this is a get message which means you know i can easily change this to a 10 and change that to a hundred or i can change it to anything i want right so that means you know you cannot just clean it up you know and say okay now we are good okay you can, you always have to kind of make the assumption that somebody may be trying to trick your script to do something that it is not supposed to so so there there are two issues to deal with here at least we can use the post one. well the post one is not going to help i can tell you why so you look up uh, Firefox plugin, examine, and change post variables. There's a plugin to do it, temper data. That This is my favorite. If you have not played with this, install it and play with it. You'll be surprised how much stuff you can manipulate when you're submitting something. You get to intercept the cookie. You get to intercept all the post variables. You get to intercept everything before it is submitted to the server. So now, you, you know, let's say you're dealing with Canvas, right? Okay, you're turning in a homework assignment and you look at the post of that thing. It might identify which assignment you're turning in. It might identify who you are. It might identify a few things, okay? So as a hacker, okay, the first thing they would do is go like, I wonder what's gonna happen if I change this value to this value here? Would I be turning in the same file but to a different homework assignment of another class? Can I pretend to be somebody else? <laughs> Can I turn in the homework to a class that I'm not even taking? <laughs> Can I turn in a homework assignment that's actually late but make it look like it's on time? Exactly. So now all of those op you know, questions open up only because you install this little add-on in the browser. 
I think it is really illuminating from the perspective of a developer. Once you install this and you run it and you intercept all the HTTP requests sending out of your browser, then you get to understand you know, how the other side operates. Now we haven't even started to talk about sessions. Okay, when we start to talk about sessions, which maintains the pretense of a, of a persistent connection to the server, there will be even more, you know, uh, things, more things that we need to pay attention to because, you know, the pretense of a session is really, um, it can be a security risk. I'll tell you why, why I say that. Okay, I have this question because I feel you had mentioned uh, using your hidden variable to store the, your sort sequence and your mm -hmm. key. I couldn't do it, so I ended up using the session variable in my program <laughs> Before we talk about session variables, yeah. too. Okay. But how good or bad it is to use a session variable? Like um, well, when we get to a session, session variables, we can talk about it. Okay. Now, I do want to point out one thing is, you know, if I sort it in a particular order, if I sort by author, right. and I do some insert here, A, B, C, I think I removed that one already. Yep. Get it. And I insert. Yes. It maintains the, uh, did it maintain the order? Yeah, my program does, but it, it is using the session variable too, mm -hmm. to, to get that order. Okay. All right, so getting back to this, this, this whole thing, we haven't generated a single line of code at this point. So this part, um, translate get variables to actual string variables. Okay, so we, we're dealing with the ordering now. Sorry? Oh, okay. Okay. So we are using this to generate the, um, uh, the table header. So this code is creating an array. This array has all the sortable you know, fields. So one is content, I content ID, created, author, and title. And then author field, rever um, REV. REV stands for, no, I cannot remember. <laughs> if I look at how it's used, I can probably remember. <coughs> Uh, okay, if I look at this part here, order by, so that's the field name, and then we specify, reverse, that's what it is. Okay, so it's a reverse lookup thing. Okay, so, okay, so this one is kind of complicated. I got to explain it a little bit slower. Okay. This one here, this particular array, is mapping integers to strings, okay? If you look up item zero, it gives you content ID. If you look up con uh, element one, it, it gives you the string created. Two is author and three is title. This is the reverse lookup. In other words, if you look up content ID, it gives you zero. If you look up created, it gives you one. If you look up author, it gives you two. If you look up title, it gives you three. It's the reverse, okay? <clears throat> and the way it is used is when I create the, the header of the table, the table header, um, this is the href, this is the, the link. These are the links corresponding to the sorting order thing, okay? So each one is a href, okay? So this part you guys probably know already. Um, and then I use this you know, trick here, which is base name file. Okay, so I don't need to know the name of the file itself. So now if I rename this file to admin1.php, I don't have to do a single thing to the script to make it work. If you hard code this part to admin.php, the moment you change the script name to admin1.php because you're making a backup or you're making a new version, you have to update all of those. So this is a neat trick. I think it's a pretty neat trick so that you don't have to deal with you know, uh, uh, the dependency of the name you know, all day long. So this part here is just order by, you know, I, but I use a string for it because this way I can stay entirely consistent. When I check for the get variable at the earlier part of the, of the program, I'm using the same variable. 
If I misspell order by, it's going to be misspelled. It's going to be misspelled consistently between this part and the earlier part. As opposed to using quoted string in both parts, where I can type it correctly in one and incorrectly in the other one, then my program won't be able to sort using that particular field anymore because I mistyped it. It won't match the get variable at the beginning anymore. Okay. So equals to, and then this is how I use uh, the reverse part. So I'm basically looking up the integer corresponding to a particular field name. Where do I get the field name? It's just passed here. So this way, I have a way to look up an integer corresponding to a field name. And that is also why when you look up the hyperlinks here, okay, so I'm just putting hover, hovering over one, it says order by, it doesn't say what is the name of that field. It just says three. And when we look up the increasing and decreasing stuff, it only says zero. It doesn't say ascending or descending. Why do you think that might be useful? Why do I want to do this? This is extra code, by the way. If I did it the other way, you know, like content underscore ID and ascending and descending, you know, that's easier to do. But why do I want to do it this way? Yeah. It's less likely to be hacked, but from multiple vectors, from multiple ways. One is, well, you're taking this class so you know the the field name inside the table it are title, content, content ID, author, and created. But if you're not taking this class, can you look at this query, or can you look at this hyperlink uh, URL and figure out the names of the table, the, the name of fields in the table? Doesn't give you a clue. So it makes it less likely to have successful SQL injection because you don't even know the names of the fields. That's one. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I was just wondering uh, because you had them all the ideas stored in back and forth. But couldn't you just when you created your href assign it an ID of 10, 12, 11, you have 1, 2, 3, Yeah, whatever. you could do it that way too. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're merging the two into one, right? You're, you're basically combining the order by and the increasing and decreasing into right, one so single one number. Like yeah, that works. One is 10, another one is 11, so you know my 10 is assigned, mm -hmm. 11 yeah. is descending. That works too, you know, but either way, you're not disclosing the name of the fields in your database table, which I think is important, okay? Now, this is not really that you know, big of a deal, but when you're dealing with credit card numbers, when you're dealing with social security numbers and stuff like that, you definitely don't want to disclose the internal field names of your table, you know, that's, yeah, because you don't want that information to be available. So that's how I generate one single hyperlink for these things, for the sortable stuff. So one is for increasing order, the other one is for decreasing order. The only difference is one has a value of zero for increasing, decreasing, and the other one has a value of one for increasing and decreasing. So to, the, to a person who's really just looking at the hyperlink itself, it doesn't say much, which is the way I want it. Because I, I don't want you know, the, any person to look at um, the hyperlink and be able to figure out you know, the internal structure of the database or the script itself. Now, if I put, um, instead of order by equals to, instead of two here, I specify author, Instead of uh, increasing, decreasing, I equals to zero, I specify ascending or descending. That's an invitation to hackers and say, come on, hack me. SQL injection may work. Why do you think that is sending that message? Because it's very likely that I would just be expanding the get variable inside the select query itself. Because why else you know, would I, would, am I going to use you know, the actual name of the field and the actual name of the ordering inside the get parameters? Is to make my job easier. I just expand the get variable as a part of the select query. But that's exactly why SQL injection may work. If it is not escaped by my SQL I real string escape, real escape string, 
then SQL injection will work. But when someone look at this, it is highly unlikely that injection will work because this doesn't say anything. It relies on my own code in PHP to interpret this to figure out the actual field name and the actual ordering. Yep? I can do that. Instead of scrolling through the, uh, the YouTube thing yeah. and just have fragments at a time. Yeah. <laughs> I can do that. Okay, so I do want to kind of finish the, 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 the entire thing, so this way you guys know what you're getting, because otherwise you get a chunk of code. I mean, this is not a short program. This is actually pretty long. We are at line 229, it's only 84%. So gen action is generating an action, um, and that particular action, this is a short thing, you know, it really is just a hyperlink, and um, it's, it's these, these are actions. So gen action with an ID is really just you know saying okay what is this is the name of the get variable and this part re, uh, describes the delete delete action has a value of zero uh, edit action has a value of one okay so once again I'm just using integers to encode what I'm doing the ID part I really don't have a way to hide it so I really just have to say you know, ID is something. For people who want to obfuscate this, you know, we can you can always just kind of use a reversible function to give you a kind of weird ID over here, okay? So that people cannot looking at the link cannot really figure out what the what the actual ID is. But you need to make sure that function, whatever you use, is reversible, <laughs> okay? Because if it's not reversible, then you might have an issue. Okay, so getting out of the function de uh, definition, now we have um, the actual table generation code. Okay, so we are at 87% of the listing here, and finally, we get to this part of the script. <laughs> so more than 80% of the code of this entire program is not actually generating anything as the output. It's just processing functions and stuff like that. So now we're getting back to getting to the generation part. Um, it is not very long. I mean, you know, because I got most of that stuff done already um, by the earlier code. So this is the, the part where I get each row from the database. And I'm using a fetch assault, which is a fetching each row as an associative array. And then the first thing I check is, hey, is this ID, the ID of this particular row in the database, matching the row that I'm supposed to be editing? Because that determines, that will send the logic in one of two ways. One way is, nope, it's not, we are not editing this one, just display. And then the other direction is, yep, somebody requested to edit this particular row, give that person you know, the editable you know, fields. So that's the direction, you know, it's going in one or the other direction. If it is actually editable, then I call the function that I was talking about earlier, called gen editable role. And then in this case, I give it the actual value of the title, actual value of the author, created content and content ID. And I will also specify that this is a request to change that particular role because that's what it is, okay? I'm you know, saying, okay, you know, this is a, a, an existing ID, change this one. Otherwise, it's just printing. Otherwise, it's, I'm just displaying all that stuff. This, uh, to answer your question, this is where I use uh, HTML entity, entities. It's only when you render. When you store and when you query, you use the MySQL I real escape string, but when you right. render, this is where you use HTML entities. So you use it outside of the quotation marks. I use like, it like you would with the regular variable. Correct. Okay. So this is what this is how I stop you know those uh, XSS you know hack from happening. XSS stands for cross site scripting. That's when you can run you know the script stuff the, the client side scripting on the browser. This is how I stop that. Because you know anything that looks like that is just displaying as script. 
da da da, but it doesn't run it as a script. So this part is fairly easy. Um, I do have one funky thing here, which we talked about last time. Do you guys remember this one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. This really kind of rather long, you know, um, <laughs> regular expression replacing. I replaced it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So we are replacing the beginning of each line with open paragraph, and we're replacing the end of each line, which is a new line that the carriage return with uh, the end paragraph. So all of this is done with one single regular expression. That also kind of goes to talk, you know, to tell you how powerful regular expressions are. Okay, because <coughs> otherwise, how, how are we going to do this? It's not going to be easy, but this is like one line thing. Gen action is what is creating the plus, uh, the uh, the delete and also the edit links here. That's a gen action. We talked about that already. The only parameter that it needs is the content ID because you know each one identifies which row we are editing or which row we are uh, deleting, and that's about it. Oh, this is important too, because if if the ID of the row to edit is invalid. Okay, see how this is becoming true? As soon as, as soon as I find which row I'm supposed to edit and it does match, I say, yep, we found it. But if we did not find it at the end, outside of the loop, this is outside of the loop itself, then we just say, okay, generate the editable row but with no parameters, which results in the insert mode of this thing. So instead of editing a row, it is now just inserting, but it's also the very last row of the table. Um, and the rest is pretty easy. No, no big deal after this, I don't think. The only thing left is uh, the uh, multi-select you know, button and, uh, and also the JavaScript to generate that dialog box and confirm that you want to delete multiple items. That's about it. So the whole thing is about 350 lines, and I don't know whether it's longer or shorter than yours. I'm suspecting it is shorter. I'm suspecting the same. <laughs> it's counting by line, but line it's long program and very convoluted. It's okay because you know yeah. if I were to take this class, you know, as a beginning class, you know, and I have no PHP programming experience before, I probably will end up with a 500 line program. It's only because as I wrote this program, I turned things into subroutines. It's not only my program is wrong, it's confused. I, I can see it in a place. One thing here, one thing here, one thing here. Okay, that prompts me another question. Okay, so if I'm writing a program, like a script for a particular class as a homework assignment, and I got it done, yeah, but when I'm not done with it, it's really kind of long and confusing. You know, I look at my own code and go like, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? And so on. What do you think I would do? I'm afraid to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you knew the answer. You just want, didn't want to say it. <laughs> see, the, the thing is... I would rewrite the entire program I, I know, from scratch. It's, it's, like, it's, it's so funny, you know, like, one night I left and, and one function was working just fine. Mm -hmm. And next day I revisited and it wasn't working. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so regar regarding that is also in interesting because what you need is revision control. Okay, so revision control can really help because every time something is working successfully, you check it into the repository. So when you do something, so you have a few drinks, okay, and you go like, yeah, I can still code. Uh, uh, and then the next day you go like, what happened to my program? I got sabotaged, right? So what you do is you compare it with the last version that you store in the repository. And most tools that deal with repository or revision control can highlight the changes that you have to, you have made between the check-ins. So that would, that's a really great tool you know, for code development because one, it is quote unquote backing up, but two, it gives you a history of how you have changed the program. If you need to revert back to not just the last version, but a few versions before that, you can do that. So that would be a good thing to do, but it's it's more than what I want to introduce in this class because when I start to talk about revision control, that's going to be another week, right? That's a whole class in itself. Huh? That's a whole class. It can itself. be a class by itself, but in this class, since your homework assignments are individual, 
It's okay, it's relatively easy. You can use RCS for that purpose. RCS stands for Revision Control System. And it's already supported by Linux. Let me make sure that it is installed here. Nope, it's not installed. It's, it's just one single command to install it. So RCS can be used for revision control. Um, it's very rudimentary. Um, it doesn't support like projects or you know, something that is being worked on by multiple people. If you want to do something like that, what is the best resource? Git. Yep, G-I-T, Git. And you can use either use GitHub or GitLab. So those two are cloud-based resources. I think, I think GitLab allows you to sign up for, for free, mm -hmm. and you can have projects hosted for free. GitHub wants money. GitHub, GitHub mm -hmm. is free GitHub unless is you free. want private repositories. Oh, okay. Otherwise, everything is public. Okay, so, but I think GitLab allows you to have private yeah. stuff for free as well. Yeah, I, I would know. Okay. But those are really good resources, you know, as you guys become actual developers, you know, at work or, you know, as your own consulting business, um, it's really a great idea to use GitHub or GitLab as a tool because it's cloud-based, okay? If you are collaborating with somebody else, they can easily access your file, you know, easily access your repository, and it, it's really good at tracking changes too. You can make changes to the same file and it can resolve that as long as they're not conflicting changes. So if one person is making changes, okay, I know we are running out of time. If one person is making changes only to this part and the other person is making changes to this part, GitHub can deal with it. The Git tool can deal with it because as long as the changes are not conflicting, it can track down who made what change where. So when it is time for you to say, okay, I need to get your changes, you can use get and say, okay, give me all the changes of my partner so that I can continue with my code but without releasing my changes yet because I'm not ready. So it gives you all kinds of flexibility. <coughs> but that, as you said, is, that's, a, that's a mini class by itself, like a one unit class on the, right there. All right, so the lecture is over. If you want me to take a look at your code and explain stuff, you know, I'll still be around for a little bit longer. So, so this homework is not going to win? Let's make it due on Sunday, and I'll make the source code available to you guys. The only thing I want to ask is not to copy my code and turn it in the way it is. <laughs> so the, the next homework we will do on Sunday yeah, that has to be postponed too. So the uh, the join up the join uh, homework assignment is going to be postponed until further notice. How about that? <laughs> so how many homeworks have you checked so far? One week? Huh? Have you have you graded more than one week? Not not yet. Because I am failing this class according to. Uh, oh, we, you are all failing this class. So you know, because yes. It has three weeks of uh, scores, but only my my grade for one of them. So yep. I'm I'm at 22%. I'm, I am and way I'm behind in grading. <laughs> yes, you're correct about that. Yep. <laughs> but it's the teaching part that is, you know, that, that to me no, no, it is. I, I don't care for my grade, but I just wondering. Yeah, I, I have not, the, you know, okay. done a whole lot of grading. I'm, I'm way behind. Okay. Hey, thanks, Professor. Okay, you're welcome. All right, so I'm going to turn off the.